Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Great Minds event uh, that we are having today in, at Sheffield and we're very grateful for the hospitality. Uh, as you know, we are um, every, every event that happens uh, six monthly, we do a different topic. This time uh, we are looking at the impact of a variety of, of factors that we have some impact over in terms of our dementia risk. So we'll hear some very interesting talks on speech, music and education and their impact essentially on later life cognition. Um, just a bit of background for those of you that don't know, um, I'm, I'm Ivan Koichev, I'm the, I'm the lead uh, for, the, for the Great Minds project uh, which is hosted by us at the University of Oxford. What Great Minds is, is a um, a research volunteer register for people who want to help out with brain health research. We started about four years ago and I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm always amazed by, by the sort of response that we've had. Uh, we have over 10,000 people now uh, and we're able to support, uh, we've been able to support over 10 studies who are looking for people who are, are, in, are, are, are aging uh, with, a variety of, uh, with a variety of projects. So if you want to, if you're not part of Great Minds and you want to become one, um, then there's obviously some leaflets uh, that we have at the front. Um, and uh, if you are joining us online and you want to find out more, then go to greatmindsfordementia.uk and there you can find out how to sign up. Uh, without further ado, I think it's, uh, it's, it's time to hear from, from the first speaker. This is going to be Dan Blackburn. Uh, Dan is, is a medical doctor who completed his degree in 1998 and then did his medical training in London. He's worked as a, a neurology SPR in both uh, Singapore and Nottingham before joining the University of Sheffield as a PhD in 2005. Um, he has a specialist, he specializes in dementia with research interests that include non-invasive scalable diagnostic tests for early dementia or cognitive impairment. Um, he's investigating novel mechanisms uh, of diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, post-stroke dementia, and other dementias with a particular focus on um, automated ass assessment of language and uh, electroencephalography. Um, he co-leads the development of the Cognospeak uh, project, which I'm sure we'll hear, hear a bit about, uh, with Heidi Christensen from the Sheffield Department uh, of Computer Science, uh, which uh, which essentially employs automated assessment of cognition that can be undertaken in people's own homes. There are several ongoing grants to develop this for the use of memory assessment pathways and in the post-stroke population. Um, he's also working on novel uh, resting EEG uh, approaches to detecting cognitive impairment. Um, and I understand that the second half of the talk is going to be done by his uh, research assistant, Caitlin. Uh, Illingworth, who will uh, continue where Dan left off. All right. Thank you, Dan. I'm a, um, a neurologist and I work across the road at the Royal Hallam Hospital on a Monday morning and assess people who are concerned about their memory. And we typically see people aged under 75, um, see people in their 50s um, to make an assessment about their cognitive function and looking for the very early signs of neurodegeneration. And I'll talk about some of the issues about working in memory clinics and working in the national health system at the moment so there are long waits to be seen and we know this we hear this in the news a lot some people are waiting for surgery but when people are worried about having dementia it's it's a long time to wait and we can see that people are waiting anywhere from zero to uh, zero weeks to 104 so two years to be wait to be seen um this was happening for a long time even before covid so um this sort of stemmed from work that David Cameron produced about the sort of dementia challenge. Dementia was underdiagnosed internationally and in the UK. So there's a push for, for GPs to refer more people to secondary care clinics. Um, during COVID, clinics shut down. And when they reopened, they, they, they used telephone and video calls. So we can see that about a quarter of um, memory clinics are using telephone calls. So there's technology being used in there already. Um, so um, GPs are still the gatekeeper for people being referred to see us and they typically use pen and paper tests similar to the one you see on the right there, these six simple questions. And there are problems with this. One, they've got to find that piece of paper to do the test. They have to record it and send it on. But also if somebody is of a high level of functioning, so we'll hear about education, someone very well educated, they'll have to deteriorate quite some time before they fail that test to meet the threshold that a GP may need to refer on. So therefore we see people at too late a stage and secondly, if people have got 
a sleep disorder or they've got a, a mood or anxiety disorder, they may well fail this test and get referred on to see us when actually they, they'd be better served perhaps seeing in a different clinic. And this is shown here, that's sort of the breakdown of the diagnosis. So in the under 65 population, up to half of people don't have any evidence of neurodegeneration when we do all the assessments. And if we could reassure these people and diagnose them earlier without them coming to see us, that'd be a huge saving in efficiencies for the, the memory service. We'll be able to reassure those people earlier rather than reassuring them after they've waited a year to see us. And we're able to see people with early onset Alzheimer's disease more quickly. So um, we're gonna hear a bit about speech. So this is sort of, um, what sort of question would you ask somebody that you, if you wanna probe their memory? So this is um, a former president of America. Oh, get back. You know what uranium is, right? It's a thing called nuclear weapons and other things, like lots of things are done with uranium, including some bad things. So it's probably not fair for Donald Trump to ask himself about uranium, which he knows nothing about. But he, there's lots of things on the internet about whether Donald Trump had a cognitive disorder and he used these high, like sad and bad and very simple vocabulary. And, and there's been a lot of information about language being affected in Alzheimer's disease, even before the early stages. And we audio and video recorded people who came to our clinic. Um, and who look, you live together. Yeah. Who looks after the money in the house? Christine does. Has she always done that or has that changed? Okay. Has she always looked after the money or has that changed? Okay. So managing finances is a Interesting question to answer is, it, it, is the level of functioning, how people are doing. And then I probe his recent memory. So when did that change? And this person has got Alzheimer's disease and he found that question really difficult to ask. And, and we ask people these sorts of questions. Let you down. So can you tell when your memory, when you first noticed it, when it let you down? Can you give me an example of the last time your memory let you down? Not exactly, no, but uh, it's happened quite a lot. It's quite a lot, but he, <coughs> his answer is, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. Yeah, I can't, and, and he can't give me an example of how his memory let him down because he has a memory disorder. So asking that question is quite difficult for him to do. And people say, oh, it's, it happens all the time. It's, yeah, and they, they can't give specific examples. Whilst this patient, again, I asked the same question. Can you give me an example of the last time your memory let you start letting oh. down? Uh, that's um, I was on the telephone making an appointment for someone at work and they send appointment cards out to him and I picked the appointment card up and I said to the customer, right, I will send you a... Uh, and I couldn't think of the word appointment card. Okay. So this person, again, giving an example, she can remember it. It was, she had a, a word block. And despite that, in the hour long appointment with me, she has no word production problems. And her response to that inability to get that one word out is there's something terribly wrong with my memory. And we, there's a term sort of functional cognitive disorder, people who are excessively worried about their memory and when their memory lets them down, which happens to us all the time, we always find ourselves walking into a room or not sure what we're doing there. But the response is, you know, potentially abnormal overreaction and they come and see us into clinic. So if we could reassure these people at an early stage, that would be a very useful thing. So on the basis of this research we did where we audio and video recorded people, we gave these audio files and video files to a linguist and a linguist who had no training in neurology or cognition and was able to distinguish people who had early stage Alzheimer's disease versus people who were worried about their memory. And so therefore that gave us further evidence that we could distinguish people based on their language profile. But that's not a scalable approach. And therefore we've developed this um, system called Cognispeak, which is a talking head on a computer that asks a series of questions similar to the questions that I ask in memory clinic. And it uses automatic speech recognition and machine learning to classify um, their cognitive level. And this is what it used to look like. We've been running this for quite some time. Hello, I am the avatar consultant. Questions today. This avatar is designed to reproduce what happens in the memory clinic. Thank you for agreeing to take part. I will start to ask you questions shortly. 
when we first started it, we had a very simple front end. There were problems with lip sync. I had to use my voice just for the simplicity of it. But people have told us they'd rather speak to a human-like person, so rather than it being a computer-generated person and a computer-generated voice. Um, and we analysed, um, this is sort of data from about three or four years ago where we had cases with Alzheimer's disease, people with mild cognitive impairment, people with functional cognitive disorder, and healthy volunteers. And I think it's important that you, you have this FCD cohort because they're the ones w that, that we have to distinguish people from when they come to memory clinic. There's not healthy volunteers that are coming. Um, and this is a, uh, it's called a confusion matrix, but if we could accurately recognize those with MCI and Alzheimer's disease 86, 87% of the time. And, and similarly for the healthy volunteers, we could correctly identify those, showing that with this system, we, was, we had an accuracy that was as good as these pen and paper tests that the GPs are doing. And that's essentially what we're trying to achieve with this test, that we want to take some of that work from GPs for us to be able to do this in an automated assessment. For this to be scalable and, and, and usable, it has to take the, the t place of clinician's time. So we got funding from the NIHR, which is the largest fund of research in the UK, um, to develop CongSpeak further. We've been using Great Minds um, as a portal to recruit people, so we can see we recruited 51 people from Great Minds. And again, with many of these portals, the, the majority are healthy volunteers. We recruited eight people with MCI, which is really where we want large numbers of people who've got early stages of cognitive impairment. And ideally, we want people with mild cognitive impairment who've got proven biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease to see whether we can separate MCI, who is due to Alzheimer's disease, such as MCI due to other um, disorders. We're also open on joint dementia research, which many of you heard about, which is funded by the government and Alzheimer's Society and Alzheimer's Research UK in three different arms. Um, in the MCI arm, we've recruited 27 in total. We've contacted a lot of people with uh, MCI from Joint Dementia Research. But you can see, so 27 is more than the eight from Great Minds, but it's not a huge amount more. Um, with dementia, again, there's quite a large number of people on there, but people register on Joint Dementia Research and they may have been given this diagnosis two, three, four years ago. So those people diagnosed with MCI may have progressed and now have dementia, may now have been in a nursing home. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult to um, address them. In terms of recruiting healthy volunteers, it's much more successful. There's like over 40,000 people on JDR. We initially, we sort of set it up so we would be matched to them, then we would contact the person. And actually we realized a much more simple system was that healthy volunteers could be matched to Cognispeak. They can go to our website, and they can register themselves uh, and, and access it. So they don't need to contact us at all. And because of that, we've now got over 500 healthy volunteers from Joint Dementia Research, and we've got over a thousand recordings using Cognispeak. And that's across the UK, uh, including Northern Ireland and Ireland. So we're getting a really large database um, of speech recordings of people using Cognispeak, which is quite exciting. So um, my last slide is just to say that people with mild cognitive impairment, we want more people with MCI to take part and speak to Cognispeak. Um, we're recruiting in our clinic, but there's also opening clinics in Manchester. Uh, we, are, we are opening in Oxford and we're exploring how to reopen that because it's time consuming setting up in different sites. Um, we're opening in London and we're also working to work with healthy volunteers from ethnic minority groups. And I'm going to hand over now to um, Caitlin, who's going to give you the rest of the talk. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm a research assistant here helping out with the Cognospeak project. Uh, and one of the main uh, areas that I'm helping to, to look at is looking at um, Cognospeak, but with people who speak English as a second language uh, and for ethnic minority groups. So currently dementia is the leading cause of death in the UK and almost a million people are living with the disease. Uh, and this is set to keep increasing uh, and especially amongst ethnic minority groups. Um, so there's many barriers, additional barriers, that people from ethnic minority groups face in trying to get a dementia uh, diagnosis. So there are social barriers like stigma uh, and uh, linguistics between like what does dementia mean in a different language versus in English. Uh, but I'm more going to be talking about the language barriers and the current memory assessment tools that we're using in the memory assessment pathway. Uh, so there are language barriers in terms of um, if someone speaks English as a second language, having an interpreter available for them at assessments is not always possible. Uh, and currently the memory assessment tools that we use uh, 
uh, across the NHS are based on the norms of people who speak English as their native language, uh, which I'll talk about some of the difficulties that this has a bit later. But to try and kind of investigate this and combat this in the creation of Cognospeak, which is a language-based assessment tool, uh, we collaborated with ISRAC. And ISRAC is a Somali community group based here in Sheffield. Um, and we trained two research champions from within the Somali community on how to administer some of the more common pen and paper cognitive assessments. Uh, so that being the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale, the Multicultural Cognitive Examination and the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And the MOCA, which is the nickname for the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, is one which is very frequently used uh, currently in these secondary care clinics. Um, so we use these research champions because it helped to break down the traditional barriers to research participation that we've seen with these uh, community groups. So there wasn't that language barrier and there was that uh, level of trust that someone from within the community was going to be talking with them about this. Um, we didn't just ask them to recruit participants, we also wanted their feedback on the creation of Cognospeak. So Cognospeak involves talking to an artificial agent uh, and initially we saw that Dan was the, uh, the computerised doctor but we asked uh, the ISRAC community group and they told us that actually they would like to see people uh, across uh, different sexes, different ages and different uh, skin colours to be available for them to talk to, to depending on who they feel mo most comfortable with. Um, so these are the artificial agents who are now available to talk to. Um, And this is kind of what it looks Welcome like. Welcome to Cognospeak. Cognospeak is a digital tool used to assess people with memory problems. We will ask you some questions and record your responses. This is what we call the assessment, but there are no right or wrong answers. The questions are very general. We would like your answers to be quite long to help us have enough speech recording. So we were able to get a much more realistic person to be talking and conducting the assessment with the person. Uh, and we didn't see a massive change in the proportion of people who are talking to one avatar versus another. It tends just to be the first one who's clicked on automatically. Uh, but it was uh, good feedback to receive from this community to see how could we make people feel more comfortable taking these assessments. Um, so I mentioned the pen and paper assessments. Uh, and on the screen, I've got the results from the Somali community group. So we recruited 52 participants. Um, the average age was around 41, which is much younger than would usually be attending these clinics. However, we were more focused on the fact that a lot of these individuals, well, all these individuals didn't speak English as their first language. Um, so the MOCA is the assessment uh, in the bar in the center. And we found that almost almost half of the participants from the Somali community group wouldn't reach the threshold to be classed as cognitively normal on this assessment, uh, despite the fact that all of the participants who took part were cognitively intact. Um, whereas by comparison, the, the MCE and the RUDAS, uh, these were much, much better for this community. So 98% of the participants met that threshold of being cognitively normal. Um, so it's just kind of showing us that actually the current assessment tools that we're using may not be the most appropriate across the demographics who would be coming into these memory clinics. Uh, and as part of these pen and paper assessments, we have verbal fluency tasks, and that's also part of the Cognospeak uh, assessment. So this is where we ask participants to name as many words as possible that are an animal or are beginning with the letter P. Um, but what we found is that not only were the participants from the Somali community scoring significantly lower than the English native speakers, uh, but also there were language barriers that we hadn't quite anticipated. So one of the participants from uh, the Somali community group told us a letter P doesn't exist in Somali. So P and B are both bilabial phonemes, which basically means that they're produced using the same part of the mouth. And if you don't have the letter P in your first language, it is incredibly difficult to tell it apart from B. So a lot of participants were either saying that they couldn't think of any words that began with that letter, or they were providing us words that began with the letter B, which can't be scored as a, as a correct response. So they were getting these 
much lower scores, not because necessarily they had a memory issue, but because that language barrier was preventing them from being able to really show their cognitive abilities. Similarly, we had a participant tell us that as much as they uh, can say these animals in Somali, they don't know the translation in English. So again, just kind of showing us actually the ability to, to say an animal or a specific word in English shouldn't be the preventative measure for being able to score as cognitively normal on these assessments. So we will be uh, changing what letters are available for someone to do uh, the phoneme assessment. And with this kind of naming as many animals as possible, we looked at what is available for uh, an alternative. So there's something called the supermarket fluency task. So instead of asking for animals as the category to name as many things as possible, it would be asking what are items in a supermarket that you can buy? And this is something that is much more representative of what's required in day-to-day -day speech, but also in kind of day-to-day -day encountering of these words. And we found that across the levels of uh, English language fluency, that the Somali participants scored significantly better. So this kind of indicated to us that it's very likely that using something that is more relevant to them, but also that they're more likely to have encountered and have to know the translations of, is better as a representation of their cognitive abilities. So we're hoping to include this also within Cognospeak. So whilst we're talking about Cognospeak, because that's the, the main area of focus, there is also kind of implications that are much wider. So looking at the actual memory assessment pathway, it is very likely that using something which is more multicultural in nature has been developed with not just English speaking norms like the multicultural examination or the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment Scale is much better for a cross-community um, diagnosis of dementia or at least screening uh, than something like the MOCA, which is what is currently used. Um, we've also now much more aware that using, uh, ensuring that the phonemes that we're using in these verbal fluency assessments are actually present in the person's native language is incredibly important for making sure that there aren't those additional barriers unnecessarily placed in front of them being able to really express their cognitive abilities uh, and that we're going to be using these um, category fluency tasks that are more representative of actual knowledge that they're likely to have for um, their second language. So the way that Cognospeak works is by analysing the speech and language, both in terms of the content, but also the pauses, the, the syntax, the grammar uh, that make up the speech. Uh, and analysing that through language models and through artificial intelligence. But if we were just training Cognospeak on uh, English native speaking uh, cohorts, it could actually train bias into the model. So this is why we've been actively going out and recruiting uh, individuals from ethnic minority groups and those who speak English as a second language to make sure that just because they're speaking a second language doesn't automatically flag them as having a cognitive impairment. So we've worked with the Somali community, we're going to be working with the South Asian community in Sheffield but also in Bradford uh, and we're going to be working with the Sheffield Chinese Community Centre also. So we're focusing on this ethnic minority uh, community group recruitment, but we're also going to be looking to see how Cognospeak could actually fit into the current memory assessment pathway. So to do that, we're going to be interviewing GPs to kind of see where they feel they'd be comfortable having this within the current uh, screening system. And we're going to be then trialing Cognospeak in the memory assessment pathway to see if it actually can help to reduce the burden on the uh, memory services that we're currently seeing in the NHS. Uh, and the MCI group that we're really trying to recruit at the moment, uh, we're going to be doing longitudinal follow-ups to see if we can track kind of the possible deterioration in language over the course of the disease. Thank you for listening. If you're at all interested in taking part, you can sign up through Great Minds, but there's also some uh, flyers where you can get some food and drinks with my email on if you want to get signed up through me also. Thank you. Any volunteers for this, do you provide feedback to them or feedback to the GP? If, you know, sort of, if you pick up anything where there may be mild co cognitive impairment or early stage dementia, would you provide the feedback to them? It's a really good question. So we, we, so we do have a newsletter so to, to feedback to people generally about the results of the study so people can understand how it's going on. If there are these, these tests, 
at the end of Cognispeak, they get invited to an online neuropsychology test, which is a, 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 somebody in U University College London has helped provided that. If people do score particularly low, then we can contact the GPs uh, on their behalf. And we're also measuring mood. So they, they do a, a depression and anxiety scale. And again, if people score highly for that, they can send for us to share that information with their GP. So that is available, yeah. There's an online question. Um, can anyone access the Cognispeak online? Yep, you can um, go to the Cognispeak website, um, which we can share with you. But if you Google Cognispeak, it comes up quite easily. And the top right hand of the screen, there's a there's a banner to say to volunteer. So that you can click on and as a healthy volunteer. This this is not designed like this isn't a validated test. This isn't designed to be a way of people testing their memory on the internet. And we know there are lots of tools doing that and there's lots of problems with them. We, we want something that is scalable and used in the NHS, but, it's, but we're not there yet. You know, we, we, our accuracy is, is good and remains high. So we've analyzed some more data and our accuracy is around 90% for like detecting MCI. So we're confident this is going to work, but we, we don't have a validated tool yet. I can jump in with a question. Um, so obviously, you, you know, underneath the Cognospeak um, assessment, there's a, an artificial intelligence machinery at work. And I, I wonder whether you can tell us which features of, of the voice are coming up as strongly associated with re with features of dimension then related to what Caitlin was talking about, whether there's any ethnic differences in, in, the, in, the, in the nature of the speech, as it were. Yeah, it's a really good question. So our our research came from linguists analyzing these data, showing people's uh, answering questions about their recent memory, sort of being pauses and gaps in there and these clinical features. There's been a huge increase in the development of AI and machine learning and a lot of these black box tools. So obviously we're using the best possible techniques we can. So we're pulling out those. So it's quite hard to extract those features. So we're, we're at the moment, we're working with them to try and explore which features, which questions are the best, because obviously if we could have fewer questions, we've got a shorter assessment. And also we're developing a report to go to a clinician and we wanted a report to go to the person who's taken part. And we can't, we can't give the report as the black box says this. So we're, we're doing a lot of work on that, but it's, it's, it's harder than, than I thought. And I'm sure you understand this is quite tricky to pull out those things. And I think what we're going to find out is we will, we will ask the engineers, can we check these features? And they'll say, yes, yes, we'll pull them out. But we won't re I don't think we'll ever know which are the, the, the most discerning ones. And we know that the ones we've got aren't the most discerning. And it's both acoustic and linguistic. So the, the recognition of words is really important, but also the acoustic signals there. It's, it's the problem with machine learning. Obviously, it's very popular, and it, I think it's fair to say it's all the rage. But as you said, it is a black box, so it will give you an answer, but uh, you won't necessarily know why the answer is the way, the way that it is. Go on, Simon. Kevin has asked, in assessing the recordings from Cognispeak, could a person's speaking style confound the results, such as someone who naturally speaks more slowly? And it shouldn't, that, that's why we want this really large collection of healthy volunteers to make sure that they're, they're not biased. So we... I, we didn't show a map, but we've recruited from Scotland, the south of England, Ireland. And we know that often the automatic speech recognition modules, which are designed for different, like there's an American, there's a Singaporean. Um, but in the UK one, it works better for southern English accents rather than the north English accent. So we, we want to make sure it's not biased if you come from Liverpool or Newcastle or you speak, speak more slowly. And, and, and it shouldn't be biased by those features. Well, in the longer term, in the longer term, would you aspire to a situation where everybody is given the assessment in their first language? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that, that is the future, isn't it? The models for automatic speech recognition, they're more advanced in like English and in Chinese population sort of thing. Um, so we, we are interested in exploring. It, it's just the complexity of trying to do everything all at once. Um, but that's definitely our aim. And I think for the fluency task in particular, that it's really important you can recognize the words people produce because you've got to say whether that is an animal, um, whether it begins with the letter P or not. So you'd have to have really good quality automatic speech recognition for that. But definitely that's our aim. Okay, and Megan has asked, how long does the screening take on Cognispeak? So it takes about 20 to 30 minutes currently. So, and that includes the uh, mood and anxiety screening and there's some brief feedback at the end. Um, but we are investigating, as, as we said, 
which are the most discerning questions and you know if we can have a, a shorter version particularly when we want for a longitudinal assessment to keep people engaged in this process we want to keep that shorter and, and our, our we can we've got we haven't published it yet but from the speech recordings we can predict their scores on both depression and anxiety scales so in the future we'd like to take that part out which would you know take off probably five to ten minutes of that assessment to make it much shorter and just a a conversational and the fact that it's conversational which generally more I'm not saying it's terribly enjoyable but it's an easy approach rather than doing these pen and paper or cognitive tests where people feel they may have passed or failed it okay and a, a data protection type question dan how are volunteers voices protected from data collection outside your project crudely can they be stolen so that we're, we're following all the guidance. So we're working with a company in London that's helping us collect the data to make sure that's all um, safely stored and, and can't be stolen. And then they're um, um, stored on University of Sheffield servers for the analysis for the machine learning here. Great. OK. Got one more. If I, yeah, let's I think go. We've got, we think we've got some time, Ivan. Um, so, sorry. Um, are there plans to compare Cognispeak to other tools available in the market so that the performance of a few can be compared on a common basis? Yeah, and that, that's exactly what we want to do. That's what I want to do as an NHS. I, I don't mind, you know, if Cognispeak is, is not the best because I want the first one to the NHS. The, the difficulty arises with the commercialization. This will, will end up being a medical device, so there is some sort of commercialization costing inferred with that but i think it'd be great to compare to about these other tools out there so there are other companies in in other parts of the world that are looking in it's similar things and trying to work out which are the best features fantastic thank you very much dan thank you um and uh, we're moving on from speech we're moving on to music uh, and we're going to hear from uh, from jennifer mcritchie um she has a background in both electrical engineering, music and cognitive uh, science, and her research focuses on the acquisition and development of motor skills in instrumental performance and how these can be used to promote health and well-being. She has conducted research in a variety of environments and typically collaborates with academics across fields from engineering, music, psychology, music therapy, physiotherapy, nursing and others. Uh, she uh, had completed an undergraduate and PhD students in, in electronics and music at the University of Glasgow, uh, and after which she moved to a postdoctoral position to uh, to the uh, Conservatio della Svizzera Italiana. All right, well, in Lugano, Switzerland. I'll take I'll take criticism. <laughs> Dr. McCritchie joined the Marx Institute for Brain Behavior and Development at Western. Uh, Sydney University in 2014 for a research lectureship in music uh, perception and cognition, moving to a senior research fellow in health and well-being across the wider university. Three years later, her research moves from looking uh, at expert performance to considering how these skills are acquired for novices, particularly looking into older adult health and well-being. And she's currently an adjunct research fellow at the Western yeah, yeah, Sydney University, uh, and she has been at the Sheffield University's music department since 2021, 20, uh, where uh, she's, she's investigating new musical technologies for older adults through a new KRI Future Leaders Fellowship. Fantastic. Well, let's let's hear from Jennifer. Thanks for that introduction. That um, removes the need for me to talk about all these different things. Um, but it's just to say that I do work across disciplines a lot. Um, I guess what I'm going to talk to you today about is some of the experimental designs that we've been doing in terms of music education, particularly for older adults taking up a musical instrument for the first time. And I'll explain a little bit about why. Um, and I also do a lot of work with dementia community groups in Sheffield, looking at new ways of interacting with music. So if we think about playing a typical traditional Western musical instrument. Um, it requires a lot of different cognitive processes to be happening at once. Um, as we get further into the dementia journey, that might be something that is a bit more challenging, but there are many, many benefits of music participation. So we work with a lot of community groups to think about how we might develop new interfaces so that people can still enjoy and connect through music together. But that would be for another day. Um, what role do the arts play in later life? There's been some very recent work around creative health. So there's a new creative health review that just came out earlier this year as well that really kind of talks about a multitude of well-being benefits for being 
continually involved in the arts. And really what we find is it's um, that repeated, long-term, sustained engagement in arts and culture that seems to relate to increased well-being for older adults. And the community cultural engagement does show a, a relationship to a lower hazard of developing dementia in later life. But why would music be a particular cognitive intervention to look at? There's been various kind of theories around why music is um, particularly useful in this respect. There's a number of different capacities that do make it an engaging cognitive intervention so that you're likely to come back and do that in that repeated and sustained way that I talked about before. But there's also a lot of social um, and emotional elements behind it as well that make it a particularly rewarding experience. Not so, um, not least so the kind of cognitive benefits that are hypothesized to come from that process of learning how to play a musical instrument. But music, when we study it as an intervention, is complete. It's quite complex. Um, so there are a lot of different working parts behind it um, that we might need to hypothesise what the contribution of all of these things are in any one context. So there's all the different rhythms about, um, sorry, all the different elements like your melodies, rhythms, harmonies, what genre of music you're using, and then the amount of motor interaction that you might be doing within any one musical activity, the amount of social interaction that that involves as well. All of these different things are moving parts that if we were going to study it in terms of its its outcomes and um, we need to be sure about what all those different things are and then of course when you add individuals into the mix with different preferences different abilities different motivations for doing music then of course that, that kind of makes a, a richer picture but also a, one that makes it harder to tease out those specific effects Music's often used in a number of different contexts as well. So the context I'm going to be talking about is a very kind of formal approach to music education, but music's being used for health and well-being, particularly for older adults, in a raft of different circumstances with a raft of different expertise. So there's a lot out there and I'm going to talk about one slice today. So music and the brain, what are the main arguments behind this? It's that music training might boost cognitive reserve or increase brain plasticity. And that's been the theory that we've been working towards in trying to uncover any evidence to show what the um, cognitive effects of engaging in music training might be. And a lot of this comes from correlational studies where they've looked at people who've had music training over a large part of their lives versus people who haven't had that um, opportunity and older musicians seem to perform as well as younger adults in auditory tasks such as detecting speech from noise. Um, there's also a link between cognitive performance and older adulthood and the number of years of training of music participation as well. So there seems to be a correlational link um, when you have people with lots of musical expertise. What research is trying to kind of investigate at this moment is if you take that into an interventional um, context, can we see if there is a, a distinct boost in cognitive abilities that is particularly tied to the musical training? And that is a harder picture to try and really look at. So I will go through some of that evidence just now and tell you kind of what the extent of that is. Essentially, there's been a few short-term music instrument training programs that might suggest there are some weak effects on cognition. Um, so there are, there are some measured effects, but the effect size of that is not is not moderate or large, let's say, um, at the moment. And those short-term programs, we're talking about eight to ten weeks, maybe up to about three months of musical training for people who have never really learned how to play an instrument before in their lives. Um, the other types of comparisons that are happening, Jennifer Bugos has done a study with um, music education versus the kind of more traditional computerised cognitive training. And that did show a difference in terms of the verbal category switching. So the task that um, that they were talking about earlier on, about naming all those different categories, um, naming all the different words in a particular category. And um, people seem to do better at switching between different categories when they've done musical training. Um, we did a study in Australia that was also about an eight to ten week program and we looked at how fine motor skills were developed and whether that translated into um, acts in everyday living, so using your fingers in different tasks and the results were a bit mixed. So the, the big conclusion around this is music research is interesting, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm from people that take part in music or that teach music that this might be a good cognitive intervention but really we don't have the studies to really show what the effects of that might be and those limits and extents of it. Um, 
the most latest study has been a year long that looked at a music education program compared to music listening and this was happening in Germany and so I have some of their results as well to show but also to show some of our work that's been going on that happened um, in Australia. What are the main contentious arguments around this? So really it boils down to do musicians have had this lifetime of experience are they having a cognitive intervention that no one has had the chance to access yet? Or are there particular types of people that will gain musical training earlier on in their lives that have a particular cognitive advantage? So really it's trying to figure out, is this something where as a typical type of person will pursue music instrument training? Or is music instrument training really the one that's responsible for those cognitive differences? And this again comes back to, uh, there's a meta-analysis here, but it's really talking about 13 studies. So there's only really 13 studies that are looking at these comparative effects. And really the, the best that we have so far is a weak effect on cognition. So there may be some advantages in processing speed. And again, that category switching. What I would propose as well with this is we're looking at one very small slice of music. Have we examined music enough to really know the answer yet? Possibly, possibly not. Schellenberg, who's one of the main critics of this as well, is saying that musical training is something that's really broad and undefined to really describe how we all engage with music over our lives. Um, so really, I think a lot more has to be done here. Let's see. If we look at it in terms of how it's been looked at from a cognitive intervention type point of view, it's mainly keyboard instruments, so it's one type of instrument that's looked at. It's mainly looking at traditional Western staff notation, so you have to be able to read those um, notes on the page before you then learn how to play. There's a lot to do with learning how to reproduce melodies, so there's a certain degree of can you get a melody right or not. There's a lot of other ways to make music. Um, they're very short-term programs and they focus a lot on really the measurements of pre to post kind of cognitive experiments, um, cognitive tests and experiential reports after the fact. Um, I will make an argument as well that it's really useful to know whether people are developing musically or not in these programs because of course that's part of the mo motivation in picking up a musical instrument. I would also like to say that I think there is an important element of creativity in some of these arts interventions that it deserves some examination. So creativity as an action has really been looked at. So we have kind of songwriting programs um, for well health and well-being. It's also looked at as a, a process, a way of self-expression. But creativity in its daily essence um, is something that is funneled into a focused program such as the arts. So there might be reciprocal effects if you are exposed to something where you're being more creative. Sorry, I'm moving around a lot, that's my hair. Um, if you're in a program where you might be flexing that creative muscle, let's say, is there any way that that's transferring back into your daily activities where you might be more flexible? That's something that's still yet to be determined. So what I will kind of do as much as I can, because a lot of these results are still I'm showing you things that haven't yet been published. So we're working up a lot of these papers just now. But this essentially is two studies involving 150 plus older adults in Australia. One of these is from a PhD student um, who also is a music therapist. She was asking, is there a cognitive advantage for music improvising versus what I'll call music replication? So that's the that idea of, I'm gonna teach you how to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and we'll see how well you can replicate that song. Um, so is there an advantage over improvising versus that replication over a non-active control group? And she had a between subjects design, meaning that you either were assigned to non-active control, that traditional form of music education or improvising. And that was a short eight to 10 week study. I'll also tell you about a study that we've been running over the past three years about how might music learning be optimised to boost any cognitive benefits. So leaving aside the comparison of the extent to which music should be the activity that you do over anything else, if music is what you choose to do, how can we make sure that those cognitive benefits of which there might be some um, are optimised to their best degree? In that one, it was a within subjects design. So all of the older adults that were um, coming to our study they did a lot of different tasks and a lot of different instruments and they experienced them all because we wanted to see how that affected their cognitive abilities over the 12 month period. So this is a long term project. Everyone was learning by ear, so we weren't using any kind of scores or any 
kind of ability to be able to read and decipher symbols. It was all about listening to um, melodies and then being able to recreate them or improvise. So looking at this first study about does improvising or replication have a cognitive advantage? This was run over a couple of different phases. So checking, first of all, that as an intervention, there is feasibility. People do want to be in an improvising program. The answer was yes, which is great. I'll draw your attention as well to the attrition rates as well, because I guess that's one of the um, key things about musical programs is that attrition from that is fairly low. Um, attrition from the improvising program was actually typically lower than you would find across the other studies that I've mentioned. So only 11%. Um, in the phase two RCT, that was even lower. So in fact, only 2.5% of um, participants um, decided to, to leave partway through. But that was more of that um, comparison between improvising, traditional education and a waitlist control. Um, Anita, who was the student who was, this was her PhD thesis, she had a battery of cognitive measures, including the mocha, we've heard of that already. Um, also a couple of different things about looking at visual information processing and um, pattern recognition and spatial working memory. And then a raft of self-report scales as well. So looking at whether the participant was reporting any subjective cognitive decline. So not enough to measure on an MCI um, type of assessment, but really just reporting that there might be some daily problems with memory um, and looking at general self-efficacy. So how much does a person feel that they're in control to affect their environment and how much are they in control of that? Um, there's a lot of graphs here, but I'll give you the general gist, which means that um, in in the musical programs, essentially, that global cognition from the mocha was shown to improve, particularly for those who had the subjective cognitive decline. Um, so we're using a, a particularly statistical um, form of analysis called Bayesian analysis. It means that instead of saying there is, is something or there isn't, we have strength of evidence. So here there was um, an evidence ratio that was strong, that both music education and music improvisation, when comparing to a non-active control, um, meant that for um, a cohort that were exhibiting some SCI um, complaints, that their mocha was increasing. So they were, get, they were getting better over that short term. There was also strong evidence that creativity was improving for healthy older adults that took part in the improvisation group as well. So that might be one small difference between the music programs. Spatial working memory was also improving for those with um, subjective cognitive decline. So that was a strong evidence for both musical programs um, when comparing to the non-active control. Essentially, what we find with that phase two test is there not is there not a lot of difference between the types of music that we were looking at. Um, but certainly there is a difference between not doing any music at all, as you might imagine. What we find really important to look at as well is some of the qualities of results. So what are the experiences of people as they're doing these types of musical programs? And there's also a lot of um, themes around the kind of cognitive challenge, particularly of the improvising program. Um, a lot of people mentioning the health benefits that they were reporting. A lot about creativity and empowerment. So having that confidence to be creative. And for some people feeling that that did imply, um, apply to some of their daily tasks, as well as being quite engaged in terms of the, the group learning setting and, and basically the task. See, there's just some quotes around this. Um, introducing a daily creative element to daily tasks feeling confident about solving a problem or thinking creatively about something unrelated to music. And I'll just go through these. So essentially, um, the cognitive benefits for older adults engaging in creative improvisation is that levels of general cognition generally improve for those with subjective cognitive decline um, and spatial working memory improves as well. Participants are reporting increased levels of attention. Now, there's not a lot of differences between the two types of musical programs. So what we take from that is if you do want to do music, if that is your choice, you're hoping to get some cognitive benefits out of it. There doesn't seem to be much difference at this moment in this one study between the two different types of approaches. That does help for some people, let's say, that struggle to read um, symbols from a page and be able to decipher them. It would help if some people are... Um, you know, having troubles with remembering certain sequences or being afraid of getting something wrong. So if I am going to say, right, I'm going to play a particular piece of music, but I'm so focused on the notes that I'm not getting, improvisation offers a different way of still being musical, still being cognitively challenging, um, but without some of those um, challenges that might put somebody off, essentially. 
So the final um, study I'll talk to you about is this longer term one where we thought, well, why don't we take this improvisation, this um, type of replicating melodies and look at how that looks over a couple of different instruments as well. And I've said a lot of it's very keyword based before. So we were trying to think of, you know, how how does the cognitive load, how does the, the challenge inherent in any one instrument or task affect how somebody is learning and affect their repeated cognitive motor function and cognitive function over an 18 month period. So they were getting 12 months of lessons and then we followed them up for another six months to check. We had a distinct battery of tests of cognitive skills, motor function, related to cognitive um, confidence and well-being, and we also measured musical aptitude. So really for um, thinking about a musical intervention, we're interested in how do we boost people's musical skills, as well as then thinking about whether that transfers onto any sort of global or general kind of cognitive skills as well. So I thought we might do a musical test together if everyone is up for it. Um, let's see if I can get this working. This is one of the um, tasks that we used to really look at how people's auditory memory and um, how their kind of distinguishing musical features got better over the 12 months or so we hoped. Um, let's see if I can get this. Mm -hmm. I think it's, already open. it's already open so I should just be able to... Uh, that's not anyone. Is ah, of course, so it is. Right. Here we go. So you're going to hear three versions of the same tune. I'll give you a clue, it's happy birthday. Um, each version will be at a different pitch, essentially the same tune, but played one step higher each time. Your task is to find which one is the odd one out. Hopefully that will have been fairly easy to distinguish for such a well-known song, but anyone hazard a guess to which one? Two. two, number two, well done, thank you very much. Um, for that melody detection task, of course, it wasn't really um, well-known tunes that we were doing that with, it was kind of random compositions and people had to really pay attention as to what the differences were. But it was our way of getting a proxy of how their musical skills were developing along the time, and then we could try and pin that to how their cognitive abilities were changing or not. So let's go back here. So in that task, what we see is over the different sessions, so session, the point number one is their pretest, then they have four different measures as they're going through the training, and those last two measures are their kind of um, experience after the training's finished, so that kind of six month <laughs> follow up. And again, we have an evidence ratio for a strong difference between the end of the program and the start, so essentially, by being part of the musical programme, we are developing people's memory detection skills. So one way of kind of music listening. And how this then looked when we looked at more kind of general forms of cognition, we were looking at the trail making test. So that involves kind of going from number to number on a page and being able to visually scan that and then being able to quickly go between the numbers. And then part A. So we saw that um, if you've got a higher time, you're doing it you're taking more time to do the tasks you essentially wanted to be coming downwards and that's what we saw and we also saw in part b when we start alternating um, numbers and letters so it becomes more cognitively taxing again there is that um, decrease as well so people who are taking part in this musical intervention are showing that over time um, we see that for another form of, of cognitive um, ability the digit spans of being able to re remember strings of numbers that they are increasing in that we also looked at fine motor tasks as well so they were looking how well that they, um, how fast people could tap on a surface and how they could tap with two fingers um, so really those are the types of tests that we're seeing that everybody who took part in the sessions were essentially getting better the big question for us is then how do the different tasks of what they were doing and how do the different instruments then contribute to that, that kind of um, increase in cognitive ability. What I'm going to do as well is just um, show you a few things of, of what people were doing. So very much right hand melodies when they were playing a, a familiar pre-composed song, it was something you might recognise.
but they also had a chance to improvise. So we would give people the first few notes of a familiar song and then we would give them a toolbox of ways that they could think about changing this. And so this is another participant improvising from a fragment. <laughs> going to play them all. <laughs> um, I do have a lot that looks at how people are developing musically because actually we were assessing their performances as they go as well. So it's very typical for a musical intervention for us to go, right, you're going to be exposed to some music and we're really just going to look at your cognitive abilities. But of course, we're really interested in this as a form of later life learning for older adults as well. So it's really important for us to be able to show that they are increasing their musical abilities as well. I will leave that just now because that is very music specific and enjoyable for me. Um, if you want to ask about it later, feel free. Um, I do have some participant experiences of what this was like to really embark on music learning over 12 months as well. So there's a lot of kind of advancement of um, feeling, uh, one person was saying she feels very much like a, a child does when they pick up sticks and don't know what to do with them. And over the time, she then has the ability to, to control those in a more, um, in the, more in the manner that she wants to. But what I'll just finish with at the minute is saying that that data analysis where I say that we're trying to really pick apart what the contributions are between the different instruments and the tasks is still ongoing, but that should be published hopefully very soon. Um, and there's a lot of research that spans from this work as well that thinks not only about music as a cognitive intervention, but about music for older adults in general. So we have some things here about how to support older adults in an online learning environment. This happened during COVID. At one point we were all in a group room together doing music lessons and then suddenly we were all on Zoom doing that. Um, so we had a lot of supporting participants and in fact them supporting us in being able to carry this programme on online. There's a lot about how do we even analyse musical performances that are not getting notes right versus getting notes wrong. Um, we have some supporting um, software that we're developing because some of the older adults in our um, program were saying that they had real trouble learning where the pitches were higher or lower and how to translate that onto a physical surface. So we've got some software to try and help with that. And then, as I say, we've also got the studies here in Sheffield that look about how do we design completely new interfaces that would allow a kind of skip ahead to being able to do kind of rich and aesthetic musical work without having to have maybe too many cognitive challenges that it locks out a lot of other people. So the conclusion is musical engagement can be a stimulating task with many rewards. The jury is still out as to how much that cognitive ability is general um, and as a result of music itself. But my um, encouragement to you is give it a go and find out. Um, results so far show that different types of musical engagement have mainly similar gains when it comes to these kind of cognitive abilities as well. So the answer there is really take the one that that, um, that speaks to you. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be of a particular musical form, but it's possibly that more engagement in that kind of creative task really that, that helps. So stay tuned. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Um I think it's, uh, it's it, it made for a nice, nice very well rounded off session. Uh, now, uh, there will be the option to ask a few questions and then any questions we don't get to before the uh, before the break we can uh, push them through in the q and a um, if I can if I can start um, and, and I guess this sort of unifies the theme together with dance and and, uh, and Caitlin's talk is certainly you do see patients who struggle to speak uh, with dementia but when you ask them to sing, then then it looks like it's a different mechanism. They're able and they're able to sing, and it sort of works with people with other speech problems and and tics and so on. W what is it about music that, if you like, is slightly different compared to compared to if you like just speech? Well, there's a lot of <laughs> it's a wide research area. In fact, of the overlap between music and speech or not within the brain. So there's a lot of different theories about why that is. I guess kind of boiling it down crudely would be that 
music involves so many different processes from different areas of the brain that it provides some alternative pathways sometimes and certainly that's how music therapy works in terms of um, we're particularly not even thinking just about dementia thinking about people who experience aphasia and trying to um, retrain speech um, they often learn to sing sentences and that helps them kind of regain that power some of it is to do with the kind of emotional connections of music as well. It's kind of tapping into something else. Um, so there's a lot of potential explanations as to why music can be beneficial. Um, but we need your help to do some more research to really figure out how that is. Excellent. Simon? We've had a couple of questions online about um, uh, music making w without an instrument, i.e. singing or yes. whistling. Uh, have they been looked at in terms of benefits on memory? That's a really good question, and particularly because there's a lot of push for um, dementia choirs to be established, which is really helpful. Um, and, and choirs are a really fantastic way of, of promoting health and well-being for a number of reasons. I think the focus on particularly piano for these cognitive interventions is because of the motor aspect of it, as well as um, all the other things that you have to do to, to produce music. I'm not, I've not seen one that really compares singing versus a, a particular musical. Well, no, that's, that's maybe not true. But I think it, it's something they tend to focus on ones that require those kind of fine motor skills as well, um, rather than just the singing at the moment. One more from me, if I can. Um, so the actual therapeutics then, um, presumably you deliver this through through a therapist in, in, in an inpatient, it's sort of in clinic settings. They have to be face to face. I'm making an assumption here, you can correct me. Uh, and I guess from, from that, it, whether there's room to, if you like, digitize some of these and make it into something that's a bit more scalable and doesn't take a lot of therapist time. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a very good, uh, that is a, an assumption that people make is that there has to be a skilled professional in the room. And for a lot of these musical programs, that is true. Um, a lot of people are working on ways that remove that need for expertise. There's not enough music therapists in the country. They also cost a lot. Um, so it's really trying to think about how can we widen that access to musical activities without the need for all of that that kind of face-to-face -face time. So we are developing new musical tools that would negate feeling like you have to wait for a structured time um, so that music is only something that happens on Wednesday between two and four because that's when you've got the expertise right there. How can we have new interfaces that maybe aren't like a keyboard or a guitar but still allow you to manipulate music so we're working on that right now um, at Sheffield there's others who are working on virtual choirs so being able to access um, choir rehearsals in a 3d space through VR um, so that people could do that at any time that they want so there is moves into that area what I would say is music training music music as an intervention and music therapy are quite separate um, there's a lot of different music work that goes on. Um, I do talk about it in, in one of our publications there. So there is a lot that doesn't just require on a particular type of expertise. There's a lot of people working in music and health. So do you see what there is? Um, th th first to comment, um, at the beginning you said something about um, uh, musicians sort of retaining their abilities mm. into later life. Um, some years ago I saw Glenn Campbell on his farewell tour and it was quite clear that he had difficulty sort of orientating himself on stage. Mm. But once he got going with the guitar, it was absolutely fine. Um, my, my question is, is about comparison with other creative activities. So for example, I think I read that um, some people develop artistic uh, abilities, painting or drawing, whatever, that they didn't really know they had. Uh, before they develop dementia. Okay. Um, so is there any, any parallel study that looks at um, another creative activity uh, versus music and what the difference, because the, the painting of course uses the motor skills as well. Absolutely, and you've touched upon one of the main criticisms there is around kind of arts research in this kind of area is that they're often looked at by single kind of studies. So it's 
often painting or often music or often dance. It's rarely kind of comparisons. There are um, people that have done studies that do try and compare these um, typical comparisons or music against maybe a kind of social reading group as well. And that's really the comparison there is to try and see whether music adds anything that might not be already gotten from that social connection and discussing something that you love together. Um, so it really depends on what kind of question that we're trying to ask and determining what is the appropriate comparison activity. And I think that's why it's so hard and that these arts, all these arts kind of interventions are complex. So it's really thinking about what is the single bit that you're trying to, um, to really nail down there. But yeah, it, it's a really fantastic question. We don't know yet. And then, uh, just to follow on from that, Jenny, uh, there, there's a few th questions online about the benefits of group music making, particularly mm. in older adults. Yes, and uh, um, in fact, all of the studies that we ran were group learning, um, particularly because people seem to feed off each other in terms of others' achievement. There's a real kind of group setting, particularly in the pandemic as well. And it was something that people couldn't leave their houses and they could still meet together and do something together. So there is, um, there's obviously a lot of health and well-being around gathering in groups and, and doing something that you love. Um, but particularly for older adults as well, I guess it's kind of seeing that other people sometimes are struggling with the same challenges and can overcome. Or if somebody is particularly inspiring at picking that up, then it does seem to kind of, it does seem to counteract some of the the hang-ups that we can bring as coming to music instrument education in later life, thinking that maybe we should have done it when we're younger. Um, that can be quite challenging for a lot of people. And I would say that that really it's not too late to give it a go um, and that those groups environments can be very supportive. Okay, probably the last question before we take a quick break. Um, is there scope to get involved in any future studies exploring music and cognitive impairment? That is a great question as well. Um, uh, my current work is with memory cafes at the minute in the, the Sheffield region, but if you are interested in new technologies, do get in touch. Um, I do have my email there and my Twitter as well. Um, in terms of the, the kind of traditional music education studies, we've just finished a round of those just now, but we may be then launching a new study in the future. So do, do keep in touch and I will let you know if there's enough interest. It's the volunteers and the participants that make this stuff happen. So absolutely. Great. Well, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the three speakers we've had. Uh, we will take a break. Um, in, in in the room, there's tea and coffee, people online. I think uh, you'll have to make do. Uh, and then we'll be back in 20 minutes. Uh, we'll start again at half past three. And there's another couple of talks. Hope we've all had a, a, a refreshing break. Uh, and moving straight on to our next talk, uh, which is going to be by Professor Carol Holland, who's a professor in ageing. Um, she works at the Division of Health, Re of Health Research at Lancaster University, uh, and she's a director of the Center for Ageing Research and deputy dean of the Faculty of Health and Medicine at Lancaster University. Her previous roles, in roles include director of Aston um, Research Center for Healthy Ageing and academic roles at Aston, Manchester, Warwick and Leeds University. Um, she's currently president of the British Society of Gerontology, the UK National Learned Society, representing researchers in, uh, researchers in ageing across disciplines. Caro is a psychologist whose uh, research focuses on applied impacts of cognitive and health psychology of ageing and multidimensional models of frailty. Uh, she's currently the PI uh, of the Cognitive Frailty Interdisciplinary Network, one of uh, 11 UK Research uh, Institute funded interdisciplinary network networks that are investigating the mechanisms of aging, uh, which have been awarded funding to develop networks internationally with partners around the world. Her talks today uh, is going to focus on the impact of education, lifelong learning and intellectual engagement in later life, um, well-being and the, the building up and maintaining of cognitive reserve. In this talk, she will examine the role of lower and, and higher early um, life education on later life cognitive function, cognitive impairment and dementia risks. And she will discuss the concept of cognitive uh, reserve and the role of lifetime intellectual engagement in building up of this protective factor. She will also introduce the concepts of cognitive frailty, where physical frailty and mild cognitive impairment often coexist. Examining, explaining its importance uh, and the role of cognitive reserve in mediating this relationship. Finally, she will present some studies examining specific impacts of education 
on aspects of loneliness, social isolation, psychological resilience, and technology use conducted during the COVID-19 pandemic. Fantastic. Well, I'm really looking forward to this. Cognitive reserve and cognitive frailty are, are certainly on top of our agenda. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thank you. So I'm going to talk talk as, um, as as we've just been introduced, impacts of education. So that's a bit of a focus today. And I'm also going to introduce the idea of cognitive reserve. So here's a little bit of a plan. So we're going to talk about uh, lower education as a risk factor for dementia and also cognitive decline. We're going to talk about the, the role of cognitive reserve. And I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by cognitive reserve. And then also uh, think about the, the different ways that ed education, but also intellectual engagement throughout life might affect later life cognition. And then that, that study that, that was mentioned uh, during COVID, look at, at education as a sort of resource from your earlier life that's, that may be having an impact on how you cope with things like the social isolation that we were experiencing during COVID. Okay, so um, as I think we've, we've already had today, we've had, had various figures today. Um, and it's really nice to know that my figures match somebody else's figures. Um, so we have you know, almost a million people currently living with, with dementia and about 38% 30, of us have a family member or a close friend who has dementia. So it affects an awful lot of us. Um, around one in 11 uh, people aged over 65 have dementia. So that's around about 9% of us. Um, and that increases as, as we get older. Obviously, one of the main predictors for dementia is increasing age. And there's a, a quotation here, which I think is worth just having a, 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 a read of uh, as I'm talking, is thinking about the, the projections. So a lot of the time we, we hear these things on the radio, we see them on, on websites, we see them on the news. You know, By 2030, there will be X number of people living with dementia. By 2050, there will be this number of people with dementia. And a lot of these projections are based on the projections of the population. So we're going to have more older people. Therefore, if, you know, say, 9% of them have dementia, now we expect 9% of this greater number to have dementia in 10 years time or whatever it is. But it's all based on the fact that, um, that there's nothing else happening. And, and really what we're doing as dementia scientists and, and, and cognitive aging specialists is to think about, well, what, what can change that? Not, we obviously don't want to change the number of people who are getting to, to a great old age, but we do want to change the proportion of that number of people who get dementia. And this is really the basis of a lot of the research that, that a lot of us are doing. So uh, new studies, and, and not so new now, um, start providing data that uh, dementia occurrence and risk might be changeable across generations and across populations. Um, and we can see increases and we can see decreases in different parts of the country, in different countries and so on, in different populations within our country. And as always, variation is what we kind of, um, you know, jump on as, as scientists. We're really interested in variation because it begins to give the researchers clues. Um, if we've got variations between these different populations, you know, why is this population having a higher incidence of dementia than this population? I mean, we like to sort of distinguish between prevalence, which is the, t the number of people who who are living with dementia and incidence, which is basically your risk of getting it. Um, and so we want to, to look at uh, changes in incidence that might be counteracted by changes in prevalence. So, for example, if fewer people get it, but those who do live longer with it, overall prevalence might not change um, or could even go up because of the, the numbers of people in the population. But changes in risk factors um, as a result of improvements in public health, in education, uh, in treatment for cardiovascular diseases, for example, uh, on the positive side, or increases in obesity and diabetes on the negative side, might all have relatively specific effects on the risk of dementia in particular regions or in particular populations. So this is where we start getting inequalities uh, in the risk of having dementia. Uh, so th this is quite a well-known study that some of you might be familiar with. Uh, there's, there, there's a few studies like this. I've just pick, picked one example. So Matthew Zetal was looking at the CFAS cohort study. Um, and on the basis of population models, they worked out, you know, just as I was saying, what they, they projected, what dementia incidence should be uh, 20 years later, uh, based on assuming no change in incidence. So they used the prevalence, uh, prevalence of, of older adults and they worked out what, uh, what, how, how many new cases per year, 20 years later, there should be. And they, they worked out that 200, there should be 251,000 new cases per year, 20 years later, in the populations in England that they were looking at, England and Wales, I think it was as well. 
Um, but in fact, there were only 209,000 uh, or 209,600 new cases, even though diagnosis had got more precise and had improved over the time. So, so that is suggesting that, that uh, the incidence seems to be reducing. And the figure, um, you can see, I haven't got a pointer, but uh, you can just see the, the, uh, the top, the blue, the blue line there is the earlier cohort that they were looking at and the purple line is the more recent cohort and although dementia incidence is still increasing uh, with increasing age we've got age across the bottom across the x-axis there you can see dementia incidence is increasing it's in increasing to a lesser extent and this is this is actually really important and part of you know we're looking at you know if we can have that impact by changing the way we treat different things then then we can reduce dementia incidence So um, some of the, uh, the look, putting some of these studies together, we start seeing some some in, important uh, important factors uh, and making some observations. So the reduction was significant for men and not for women in the Matthews study. Um, there was a reduction for the least deprived, as in the richer areas <coughs> and the middle income areas, but not for the most deprived, not for the poorer areas. Another study uh, which was done in I think uh, Canada or North America somewhere. Um, was looking at the reduction in hazard ratio, another way of looking at incidence or risk, um, was only observed in those who had at least a high school diploma, so equivalent in the UK to, to having finished school with A-levels, that kind of age, a, age of, of education. Um, and what's also important is that the, president, the, the prevalence of most vascular risk factors except obesity and diabetes and the risk of dementia associated with stroke, atrial fibrillation, and heart failure had decreased over time. So we got better at treating uh, the, the aftermath of strokes, of, of treating high blood pressure, of treating atrial fibrillation. And the, so the risk of dementia associated with them had reduced over time. And, and if you think about, you know, cardiovascular diseases affect, generally affect men uh, more than women. Um, and so that might be one of the explanations as to why this reduction for men was happening, but not so much for women. Um, there was also a trend towards an increasing mean age at diagnosis, and that, that might have changed, that kind of seems to fluctuate, but mean age of diagnosis seemed to go from around 80 years during the first period that Saltisabel was looking at to around about 85 in the more recent uh, epoch, which again is good. If, the more you can delay the onset of dementia, uh, the, the fewer cases of dementia you're going to have. So this uh, life course model has become really quite famous. I'm sure that people are sort of recognising that, um, which was uh, produced by uh, Livingston et al. Um, in, in 2020. There was a previous one as well. But if you look, uh, so what, what they're doing is looking at the modifiable risk factors. So there's lots and lots of studies brought together to look at these population attributable risk factors, um, uh, modifiable uh, risk factors for dementia and basically suggested that up to about 40% of the risk of dementia is modifiable and that's really good news you know it's not 100% but it's 40% and maybe there are other risk factors that we're going to we're going to discover as we go along with the research and if you note that early life education was uh, related to a 7% reduction in dementia if this this risk factor low early low early life education if this risk factor was eliminated and that that um, is, is a sort of global figure and it does it does seem to vary in different countries so we've been doing some recent work in India and it, it's it's much higher in India because there are uh, basically a, a, a more variation in the levels of education that people get from from basically nothing to, to quite high education <clears throat> and actually if you, you think about it if you look at that figure you can see that uh, that seven percent is one of the biggest it's bigger than smoking, it's bigger than diabetes. It's not as big as hearing loss, and that's another talk, um, but it is bigger than a lot of these, these other factors that we, we think of as really quite important. Um, but you're probably thinking, well, you know, maybe education isn't that modifiable. It was a long time since I went to school. I mean, it might be mo modifiable for, for young people today, for, for children now. There might be you know, some useful policies that could be brought in to make sure that people don't leave school with very little education or, or don't receive very little education. Um, but, uh, and we know that a lot of studies show a very resilient effect of years and the level of education people have had on cognitive function in later life and also dementia incidence. 
But education is not just about our early lives, and we've already been hearing about the, the, the music uh, intervention, so lifelong involvement in, in intellectually demanding music involvement, for example, as, uh, as we heard from the earlier speaker. Um, but studies also show that um, once education and brain pathology is controlled for, current and recent past intellectual engagement slows decline and predicts around 14% of the variability in late life cognitive decline in the last few years of life. So intellectual engagement throughout your life is just as important. This is a nice study that I, I really rather like um, because it was a huge diary study and uh, Hall et al, um, it was a, an American study and they looked at people who kept diaries all their lives and, and these researchers sat with all these diaries and looked at every day throughout people's lives and gave them a tick for every day that they had had some intellectual engagement and that could be, you know, played Scrabble with neighbour, uh, went to a sermon at church, it could be, you know, any kind of intellectual engagement, started piano lessons, started, started learning French or, or whatever it was. So intellectual engagement, not something that people did, did really uh, sort of almost automatically like, you know, the quick, easy Sudoku in the newspaper but something that was a bit more demanding, a bit more challenging and learning something. So they, they looked at that and they, they found that for every day of self-reported intellectual or educational activity, um, there were, it, this was related to an almost a fifth of a day delay in the onset of rapid cognitive decline in older age. So we've all, just by coming here today or listening online, um, we've all given ourselves an extra fifth of a day to delay any cognitive decline that might occur. So, so this is it. This is important. It's not just about your early life education, and obviously we'll, there, there are influences on your later life intellectual engagement of your early life um, intellect, uh, uh, early life education. Um, so people, of course, ask, well, when is the best time? When is the best time to be really intellectually engaged? And th this study tried to look at this with a longitudinal study and found that cognitive activity in midlife followed by recent, recent or later life, this was looking at older people, um, seemed to be the best predictors of cognitive reserve. So intellectual activity, as I say, learning new things, maybe practicing older ones, maybe um, transferring that knowledge or, or teaching, teaching a, a younger person those skills is all intellectual activity. So what do I mean by cognitive reserve? So cognitive reserve is the, the way that the brain actively attempts to cope with brain damage or with, with neurodegeneration uh, by using uh, your sort of pre-existing cognitive processing strategies. You might not necessarily be aware that you're doing this, but, but you have lots of different ways <coughs> of thinking about things and by enlisting compensatory approaches. And a person's own compensatory strategies and problem solving that you've accumulated via your education and by, via your lifetime intellectual engagement uh, seem to be able to mask or enable coping with and responding to the severity of any cognitive impairments that might be developing or, or any, the, the impacts of any neurodegeneration. And of course that includes your early life education and your lifetime complex cognitive function. So somebody with high reserve can cope better with neurodegeneration or, or brain damage than somebody with lower cognitive reserve. People with higher education, more cognitively stimulating occupations, leisure activities and retirements generally have more reserve. And that means flexibility in terms of how they perform this cognitive operation, um, a wealth of learned facts to call on, call on, but even down to sort of neural differences. So if you, you have lots and lots of cognitive stimulation, you're going to have more connections in the brain. So you maybe even have spare connections and neurons into some kind of damage um, on your, or degeneration in the brain. So this, this figure kind of explains what I'm talking about here. So if we look along the bottom, so we've got neuropathology, so that's not age and it's not time, it's the increase in the level of pathology <coughs> in the brain. And we've got cognitive test score going up. We've got, we've got three lines there. We've got the, the line which is the person with high reserve or the, the group with high reserve. We've got the line which is the person with lower reserve. And then we've got a horizontal line which is a cognitive test score at the point where they have a, a, an assessment for dementia. Um, it says AED but it could be other dementias as well. Uh, so what you can see is that um, the, the person with high reserve already scores higher than the person with low reserve at the beginning when there's no, no neuropathology at the far, far left. Um, but you can also see that, that the, uh, as neuropathology increases, the person with high reserve is not showing decline in their actual performance, uh, anything like as early as the person with lower reserve. 
and you can also see that it's a lot later in the in the development of neuropathology before that person with high reserve gets to that threshold so that's quite that's quite important it doesn't mean they've got less neuropathology but it does mean that it's not affecting their actual outcome performance to the same extent so there's different ways education might have an impact on later life cognitive decline so we've got the effect of neuropathology or brain health on cognitive decline and dementia so that's kind of what a lot of a, a lot of researchers are looking at um, but we've also got different effects of lifestyle on, uh, on neuropathology. So for example, we've got lifestyle one, um, which we've got lifestyle two that could affect the, um, the relationship between neuropathology and cognitive decline. And we've also got the possibility of something that affects cognitive decline and dementia more directly there. So lifestyle effect one um, could be education in terms of having an impact on the amount of neuropathology people accumulate. So education might have an impact in terms of how public health messages are received and evaluated to support healthy lifestyles and health behaviours. Um, it might also have an impact on your access to health care. It might have a, a, or, or active ageing activities or being involved in um, a, you know, an intervention of some sort and maybe uh, an impact on nutrition and levels of physical exercise, for example. And it might, it also has an impact on the lifetime occupation and socioeconomic status and therefore impact on opportunities for daily complex, complex thinking in your, in your job um, and planning skills, but also on your environment. Where can you afford to live? Are you living in an area with a lot of pollution, with poor housing, um, with crime? Um, are you experiencing economic stress? So it has, it has a lot of impacts. In, in a variety of ways on whether you end up with, um, with more, more or less neuropathology. Um, we also have lifestyle two, lifestyle effect two, whoops, which is this moderating uh, effect. So you've got this relationship between neuropathology and cognitive decline and dementia. What affects that relationship between the underlying neuropathology and the outcome cognitive decline? And this is what we were talking about with the cognitive reserve. Um, so, so, so cognitive reserve is, is kind of a moderator of the impact of brain health on actual cognitive function. <clears throat> and then what about direct effects? Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough. So direct effects have been proposed to maybe be things around social networks. Um, we know that stress, anxiety and loneliness all impact cognitive function and risk of dementia and social support and engagement kind of reduce this effect so that might be a more more direct effect so social networks also strongly modify the relationship of pathologies to cognition again a bit like cognitive reserves they have the same same kind of effect so a study by by bennett and, and, and associates suggested that neuropathology had very little effect on cognition in the presence of a large social network um, so you know in terms of you know that we, we think very much if we think about um, keeping your cognition active and keep keeping um, intellectually active as we get older we think about a lot about um, learning an instrument learning a language uh, doing the, the crossword um, you know doing something complex and, and cognitive and that's all good but also social interaction is really important as well keeping in touch with your your, your friends um, social interaction is a sort of problem solving anyway um, as well as the, the sort of emotional and supportive side of it okay I'm just going to move, so that's a sort of bit of the background, a bit of a rush through what we know about, um, about the effects of education and, and intellectual engagement and cognitive reserve. So um, this was a study that uh, was done by Eric Bolke, who's, who's it's now published, um, who was a PhD student who finished last year. And he was, was very interested in looking at um, the impact of technology during COVID and during, during sort of social, um, social isolation during COVID. So we had social distancing and of course social distancing exacerbated any social isolation that was already there. Uh, maybe um, we have a relationship between social isolation and loneliness. They're not the same thing. Some people can be socially isolated and not lonely, uh, but social isolation does often, but not always, lead to loneliness. Um, and older adults um, were drawing on, our, on personal resources. We were all drawing on our personal resources in, in a crisis situation. Um, so psychological resilience, but also technology used to combat such effects of feeling socially isolated. So we've got a picture there of, of somebody waving at grandchildren, presumably on, uh, on, on a, a laptop. 
So technology use is one factor that we know in, uh, from quite a lot of studies that reduce impacts of so social isolation on the likelihood of loneliness. So people are not necessarily not socially isolated in, in a physical sense, but they can reduce the social isolation, but they can also reduce the impact of social isolation on the experience of loneliness. Um, and what, what, uh, what we were asking was whether educational uh, level or early life educational attainment might actually shape later life potential resources um, and their impact on levels uh, on the effects of pandemic lockdown on outcomes such as loneliness. So why education? So although education is, is a, a resource that's acquired in the past for most older adults, um, there's an expectation that this investment in knowledge, this early life investment in knowledge and skills, uh, has long-term beneficial returns, as we've already talked about in different ways. Educational attainment is, is a sort of mechanism uh, or a proxy for some kind of cumulative advantage across the life course in different ways. Um, and what we're interested in is its indirect effects and direct effects in later life, including on social isolation, how much people use technology and also how they drew on personal resilience to mitigate the circumstances of the pandemic. So in this study, we're particularly interested in uh, education as a resource from the past uh, that could have continuing impact on present day loneliness. So how you, uh, how you cope with the crisis now in, in the current times and particularly on loneliness. So we gathered, uh, it was survey data, of course, everything has to be survey data during a pandemic over the phone. There was some, some of it was done over the phone, some of it was done in the post. Um, uh, we, we had about 92 people aged 65 to 92, 60% um, women. Uh, in the United Kingdom, mainly in the Northwest, the sort of Lancashire kind of region, Lancashire and Merseyside regions. Um, and we took the, these, sur this survey during from between March 2020 to June 2021, where the country was under various levels of pandemic linked uh, social mobility um, or, or mobility restrictions. Um, and the data captured age, gender, highest level of education achieved, ra ranging, ranging from none, which was surprising. I said, no, there's nobody with no education in England, but there was. Um, and through to advanced postgraduate degree level kind of education, so doctorates and, and that kind of thing. Um, they were mainly uh, white British, um, which kind of fits in with the sort of um, northwest Lancashire uh, Lancaster and, and, uh, and North Merseyside, sort of Southport kind of region. And we measured uh, loneliness, social networks and technology experience and use. Uh, so firstly, as unexpectedly, um, people were more lonely than pre-pandemic norms that we had. Um, educational level uh, correlated, was associated with technology use, with social isolation and loneliness. So it was uh, uh, associated with all, all three of our, our variables of interest. And educational level moderated the relationship between social isolation and loneliness. So again, we've got a relationship between social isolation and loneliness, but educational attainment affected that relationship. So when education was lower, there was a steeper correlation between social isolation and loneliness. So for people with higher education, there was less of a relationship. That kind of explains uh, what we mean by, by the moderated uh, effect. And then the, the, the final uh, finding was that technology use uh, mediated uh, the relationship between educational level and loneliness. So that means uh, it, it kind of is, is an intermediary effect. So we've got the relationship between educational attainment and loneliness. We've also got a relationship between educational attainment and technology use and one between technology use and loneliness. But the, this intermediary effect uh, accounted for about 31% of the total effect. So if we didn't have technology use, then there would have been a stronger relationship between educational attainment and loneliness. So in conclusion, ed educational level was confirmed as a distal resource for older adults and played an indirect role in affecting loneliness during the pandemic, has an impact on present day personal resources like technology use, which affect loneliness, and education also moderated the impact of social isolation on loneliness. 
So this sort of leads towards suggestions for interventions for, for later life learning, social support and technology training and support that would all be relevant in these kind of situations. So um, getting over the fact that maybe somebody hasn't had you know, the best of educations uh, in the past, uh, can we uh, support their technology use in this kind of situation that might have an impact on their loneliness and social isolation? Okay. So I just thought, you know, just as people finish, as we finish these talks, and I know there's another talk to come, um, but maybe start thinking about what your take home points are and we can discuss them at the end. I'm just going to finish with um, a slide here that just introduces the cognitive frailty uh, networks, the interdisciplinary network that was introduced at the beginning. Um, if you, you're, uh, you're sitting at home with a, with a camera, you can, you can use that QR code and that leads you to a very simple survey if you're interested in joining it. It's an open network. It's open to you know, scientists, lay people, uh, medics, you know, different, different kinds of categories of people. Very interested to have more uh, people involved in that. What we mean by cognitive frailty is the, uh, the sort of conjunction between uh, cognitive impairment but not dementia, so, so more mild cognitive levels of cognitive impairment, and physical frailty. So that's why we, we call it, it's not just about having frail cognition, it's about being physically frail and having cognitive impairment but not dementia, but is a risk state for dementia. Okay, I'll finish there. If I can kick off, um, so the, the topic of education and the way that it, um, if you like, builds up cognitive reserve is, 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 is fascinating and obviously very well researched. I was wondering whether there's good enough ways of drilling into a bit more rather than just looking at time spent in education, but somehow trying to get a sense of quality of education or even experience of the educational process uh, in a way so that it, we get a sense of a, you know, how cognitively stimulated were people actually during the educational process. And secondly, some people have a poor experience of, of schools and education and so on, which drives them in a way uh, in, in later life, away from, from learning or, or reading or intellectual activities. Is there a, a systematic way of looking at yeah, that? Yeah, I think, I think th th there isn't in terms of looking at the quality of education people have. And I think what we, we tend to use these days, rather than years of education, is try and look at educational attainment. So if people went on and you know, finished A-levels, did a, did a degree, did further, further occupational education. So look at the, the different kinds of education people went on to, which suggests that their engagement with education was longer and deeper. Um, but in terms of the quality of their primary school teacher, I don't think we can, we can actually address. But in terms of looking at cognitive reserve, I think, you know, in the past, a lot of the older studies really just took education, level of education, or... Uh, level of occupation as a proxy for cognitive reserve and I think there's some better measures coming out now which which you know amalgamate you know levels of education uh, cognitive reserve um, sort of lifetime cognitive engagement in in different things in the way that those diary studies do but obviously retrospective assessment so you know have you always done this once a week to, you know twice a week or whatever um, so there's some so there are some better measures of, of you know there's still proxies but but you know some better measures of, of lifetime intellectual engagement coming out that I think will probably be better measures of, of cognitive reserve yeah um. Oh, we have also a question in the room once you've done that. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask, and I think it's a problem, you know, for lots of research, but maybe particularly with this research, were people who weren't literate able to access the research? Because obviously when it comes to education, there's quite a high proportion of people who actually can't read and write. And were they able to participate or have any other studies looked at people who can't participate in, terms, in a traditional way? So if you're Just general participation. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think that's always a problem because we we're very much reliant on the on the written word, aren't we? So our adverts for participation are in 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 writing, um, you know, especially during the pandemic. You know, we we couldn't go along to a you know a social club and talk about our research, which we can normally, uh, and we do normally, but we couldn't do that during during the pandemic. So everything was was via the written word. Um, we um, we. We, we use telephones rather than computers to interview people because we, we didn't want to assume. And that was kind of what the study was ar around. You know, are you are you using, you know, using sort of technology to communicate at the moment? And, and you know, obviously a lot of people weren't. Um, the, the measures that we did were, again, over the phone. Um, we could send, if people would rather we sent stuff to them, then obviously that was depending on the written word, but, but we weren't completely reliant on that. 
Um, we had, we did have some people with very low education, as, as you say, and they were, I, I assume they were the people who wanted the telephone interview rather than anything else. But so I, I think we, I think we, we managed to cater to the people who, you know, wouldn't be comfortable um, filling in a questionnaire or something like that. So I'm, I'm hoping we did, um, but you never fully know because they might not have as, assessed, uh, accessed the, um, the study in the first place because the adverts for the study were, were in, in writing unless somebody said have you heard about this would you like to take part great thank you yeah but good question yeah sorry we've got we've got a lot online so we'll have to try and come to to most of these during the q a but do, does the um does learning of any skill or language such as trying to learn chinese letters do-it-yourself projects how to learning how to use a smartphone do they all affect cognition? I think, I think every, every, I mean, generally the opinion is yes, anything that is challenging and, and lays down new pathways in the brain that you're learning is going to be, is going to be healthy and, uh, and uh, you know, build your cognitive reserve. So it could be, you know, learning how to, um, I don't know, change a washer on a tap, uh, as well as learning some Chinese characters. You know, it's all learning and laying down, laying, laying down new pathways. I'm just wondering about, um education over time because going back probably 20 30 years ago there was a lot of adult education opportunity so local colleges further education colleges would run evening classes in all sorts of subjects which as well as being educational were also serving a social function that people could you know meet new people um and and so you went through that phase of it being well funded and well attended and now it depending on where you are in the country i suppose it's very very difficult to find um evening classes um so that's actually probably gone down again so are you sort of actively monitoring what opportunities there are out there in local areas for people to to participate because it, it could be that we're going to have a sort of good effect from all this work that's been done in the past, but now it's gone down because yeah. these opportunities are not available uh, in person. They may be available online, yeah. and and we've got U three A as well, which um, can um, you know provide some some. Uh, learning opportunities yeah, I, I think that's that's a really good point because i know sort of let's say my parents generation they might have left school at 14 but they then went to night school for the next 10 years to to um you know in, increase their education so i think using the the highest level of education achieved is is useful um but um but lifetime intellectual engagement it, you know can include you know going to night classes which exist or don't exist in different parts of the country um, but also includes things like online learning um, university of the third age those, those kind of things I mean I don't I don't really monitor whether there's night classes uh, but I know that there aren't as many as the, as there used to be and in, in some areas we have uh, so linked with universities for example we have groups of people who uh, you know come in and engage with with lecturers as, as you know we have a, our little lay audience at the back of the introductory astronomy or something like that so we do that at Lancaster um, but uh, and I know other universities do that kind of thing as well but I think um, you know that the night class culture does doesn't exist to the same extent as it used to great I think in the yep. interest of time we'll move on to to the last talk which I'm sorry to say is mine and then we'll have plenty of time for uh, to to get to all the questions that were asked uh online as well as anywhere any any left uh, in the room it'll be if you like an overview given the the uh, the recent um things that have happened in the space specifically of Alzheimer's disease um if you like to bring everything together in terms of where things may pan out in terms of uh, specifically around around the care uh, that uh, we as clinicians will be uh, giving for, for patients coming to clinics with cognitive disorders over the next five five years really five to ten years um, so as you know Alzheimer's disease is the main cause of dementia uh, especially w once you uh, once you go over the age of 65, it is it is the the uh, by far the, the most common cause. And the current understanding is that it's due to uh, the accumulation of two proteins, 
Um, these are amyloid and tau. So amyloid is this, if you like, vague blob that sits in between the nerve cells. Uh, amyloid is a, is a protein which uh, is, uh, is produced in the brain. Uh, but due to some reason, some reason in Alzheimer's disease, be it uh, problems with clearing it off or increased production, it starts to clump in between the neurons. Uh, and that uh, appears to, uh, to not be particularly helpful. And then the other thing that happens is there is a structural protein, so a protein that, if you like, keeps the, the, the body shape of the nerve cells together, called tau, which particularly when there's a lot of amyloid around, it starts to change its structure, okay? And it becomes what, what we would call phosphorylated. So it essentially, it again aggregates into, the, aggregates into these clumps of proteins that, unlike amyloid, sit inside the neurons. And the important thing about that is that these clumps of tau protein are particularly neurotoxic, okay? Wherever you have neurons, nerve cells, with this tau protein, this is where you get nerve cell loss. And that happens in a variety of, of degenerative uh, disorders, so disorders where there's nerve tissue loss. What happens in Alzheimer's disease with, two, with these two proteins? We know from studies that follow people up, um, uh, especially uh, in, uh, in, in the years before they develop dementia. And in this context, the, the studies where um, essentially it is the, 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 the children of people who develop early forms of, of, of Alzheimer's disease, we can find out that they've got the genes for it. And so there are studies, especially in, in the United States, where they start monitoring these, these, uh, these proteins from a, from a relatively early age, from people in their 20s and their 30s. And what they see is that the amyloid protein starts to change. This is the yellow line, starts to change about 25 to 30 years before people have any symptoms, right? So the truncated line is the point where people would come and see uh, clinicians uh, with some memory problems. So through these long-term studies, they're able to see that actually the amyloid has started to form into these, into these clumps in between the neurons about 25 uh, to 30 years before people get any symptoms. The other thing that happens is the, is the green line, which is this tau protein, which is the, the really toxic one, that really starts to shift about five to 10 years before, uh, before first symptoms, but more probably closer to five. And then within a couple of years before people start developing symptoms, you start to see nerve tissue loss if, they, if you put them into an MRI scanner. So I guess the, the story here is that we now know that this is, this is not a process that happens overnight but rather this is a decades long process, which is on the one hand, obviously quite concerning, but at the same time, it shows you that there is a window of opportunity, okay? Um, where you could uh, work to either build resilience, as what Carol was saying, if you like, increase the, the ability of the brain to, uh, to withstand these proteins, or in some way, work against the, the accumulation of these, of these proteins. Um, Carol spoke about this, so I won't spend too much time on this. These are the factors that mediate the, uh, the risk of Alzheimer's disease. And as she said, about 40% of these are due to factors that we can do something about, okay? Uh, be it education, but also be it a variety of medical conditions, uh, smoking, uh, levels of activity. Now, a, a burning question that is that, that arises from all of this is whether you can have Alzheimer's disease but not have dementia, okay? So how does this work? This works because now we have the methods to detect whether people have the proteins in these five, 10, 15, 20 years before they get any symptoms, right? So we can see that they have these proteins in the brain that associate with Alzheimer's disease, but for all intents and purposes, these people do not have any symptoms, okay? So now certainly in the research community, there's talk about recognizing that you can have the biological form, if you like, if you have the biological underpinnings of, of Alzheimer's disease, but you do not have, uh, but you not have dementia. Uh, and uh, to, this, to this end, um, I'm going to talk about the way that we, the diagnosis currently uh, of, of Alzheimer's disease and dementia is being done and where things uh, will go in the future. So, the, the main, there's four things that we're looking at when we're thinking about diagnosing either the, the biological state of Alzheimer's disease or the syndrome of dementia. And that is, we need to show, we need to be able to check whether people's memory and thinking is as good as we expect it to be. 
we need to be able to look at the amyloid protein, we need to be able to look at the tau protein, and also we need to check if there's nerve cell loss. How do we do this currently? Um, if you come to, to, a, to a typical NHS clinic, you're likely to see one of those where you, it's a pen and paper test and it works the various different uh, forms of cognition, memory, processing speed, and so on. The problem with this is that it is really only able to detect quite significant deficits, okay? We know that people, while they're in the, if you like, pre-dementia stages, if they've got the, the pathology, their cognition starts to shift, okay? Um, they're starting to have some, some memory issues, some thinking problems, but they're not severe enough to be picked up by something like this. So where is the, where is the field heading towards? I would say it's certainly heading towards the sort of thing that Dan was talking about in terms of uh, using digital technology where uh, you, you, can, you can use, uh, for example, qualities, the quality of people's, of people's speech or in, in other way that's not particularly taxing. I think that's certainly something that we'll see, we'll see uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of development in. But also, uh, if you like, more straightforward cognitive tests that have been just uh, done in a in a digital way that people can now do online without the need of a of, of a of a clinician uh, administering the tests. This is an example of of one of them where you have to remember uh, where uh, you know where uh, uh, what sort of symbol stands behind each of these each of these white boxes, and then it appears on the middle, and then you have to press the box where you where you saw it. And you can also use the power of smartphones, for example, where you, this, is a, this is a task that we developed uh, uh, at the University of Oxford that allows you to, um, to have very, very short sessions of, uh, of asking people to remember information. In this particular case, we show them the pictures of various uh, household items or, or animals, and then they have to remember, do they go up, left or right? Uh, and they do, for example, learn that in the morning. And then through, because it's a smartphone, you can, you can ping people after a day, after two days, after three days, four, five, six days, and check on them. How much of that have they actually remembered, okay? And in that way, you can do things that become, you know, completely impractical to do in clinic, right? You're, you're able to check people's ability to remember information four, five, six, seven, ten days later. And if you like, build an understanding of what is their, what we would call the half-life of their memory. At what point have you forgotten 50% of, of what we taught you? Okay, which is um, which is a method that it, you can see it becomes highly sensitive to very minor changes in cognition and thinking. Which, if you think back to the to the pen and paper tasks, where the delay is five, ten, fifteen minutes in clinic, you can see the power that we gain through something like this. Now, the second thing that I mentioned is is testing for for the amyloid and the tau proteins. Obviously, I showed you on the first slide that these are things that live inside the neurons. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do biopsies directly on the tissue uh, in, in, peop in living people, so we have to find another way. So there's currently two main ways where that could be done. One is through a lumbar puncture, uh, and the reason why that works is because through a lumbar puncture you pick up small bits of, of the fluid that essentially bathes the brain, okay? Or the fluid that's, that, that the spinal cord, if you like, exists in, is the same fluid that goes all the way to the brain. So anything that happens in the brain will be shared in the, in, in the same fluid. So in that fluid, we can, we can detect the levels of the amyloid and the tau proteins and make an assumption about how much amyloid and tau buildup there is in the brain. The other one is much more targeted. This is the positron emission tomography, which works by, uh, by some, some very smart people having created you know, particles that are highly targeted for, for these proteins and then they get labeled with, with tiny bits of radioactivity. And when you get injected with these particles, if you are put through a scanner that can detect this level of activity uh, for a short period before your body flushes it away, you can see a picture of where these particles are latching onto. Okay? And you get scans like these on, on the right that shows you whether there's bits in the brain where, for example, a lot of these amyloid targeting particles are being held. And that's what you get. Uh, for example, these are some amyloid scans, which on the right is what a, a scan of somebody that has a lot of amyloid in the brain looks like. And on the left, you have a scan of somebody that doesn't have a lot of amyloid. And what that tells you 
is and and what we now know is that up to 20 percent maybe up to up to a third of people that we in the clinic clinically diagnose as having alzheimer's disease if you put them to a scanner like this you find that actually it's not the amyloid that's driving this so it's not alzheimer's disease as we currently understand it but it's some other process uh, which gives rise to something that looks very similar uh, which goes back to perhaps why you know it's one of the theories why some of the uh, some of the medications that were developed for alzheimer's disease maybe 20 years ago that didn't that didn't show an effect some people have speculated it's because simply you know because we didn't have a way to show that they actually have the amyloid pathology uh, these these clinical studies were up to 20 30 percent with people who had something completely different okay which naturally reduces the chances that you're going to detect anything so what does it mean if you if you have high level of, of amyloid right and that's a question that we're going to get as clinicians a lot because uh, and, and I'll speak about this briefly at the end we are now talking about these types of therapies that clear amyloid so naturally people will uh, I think develop an interest in, in, in finding out what their levels of amyloid are so what is the practical use of these uh, of these particular investigations for most parts they are useful to for confirming or or, uh, or rejecting a, an underlying diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease this is one study that looked at what happens to clinicians diagnosis before and after uh, an amyloid PET scan and what they found that in about 25% of the chain of, of, of the cases they changed somebody being diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease clinically to having a non-Alzheimer's disease pathology and then in 10% in of people who the clinician thought okay this is a dementia but it's not due to Alzheimer's disease it changed it from non-Alzheimer's disease to actually saying this is caused by, by Alzheimer's so it really seems to be uh, settling a lot of questions around is this, is this type of dementia caused by Alzheimer's disease or not amyloid PET the other, the other thing that now has been developed is a form is a form of, of, of PET that allows you to, t to target the second protein, the tau protein, which as, as we spoke, this is the really one that the, the, the nerve cells don't like. Okay? And what you, what you see is that while the amyloid uh, protein tends to get spread out through the brain quite uh, homogeneously, so throughout the brain, tau seems to be going into specific areas of the brain. And, and in a way that, like this study shows here, shows that uh, it is you can find it in the area where you would expect based on how the patient presents okay so for example if I see somebody who has difficulty with memory I expect the problem to be in the temporal lobes of their brain so the bits that sort of sit behind the ears and if I put through a, somebody like this through a tau scanner you will see something that looks a bit like the bit on that says C okay so the signal is coming very strong it's very red in the temporal lobes of the brain okay and if you have somebody who has uh, for example problems with uh, with speech that's the first symptom symptom that they have right they have difficulty producing words if you put them through a scanner you can see that the tau is the tau signal is coming from the language areas of the brain okay so so tau is sort of these tau scans allow you to detect where in the brain the pathology is coming from and one more thing which I find is very interesting about Alzheimer's disease is that this 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 toxic tau protein has a very typical uh, if you like uh, journey okay so it typically starts from from what we'd call the temporal lobes and then it gradually moves across the whole uh, across the whole uh, the whole brain okay so it has a very typical journey and with this tau scan what you can see is how far along this typical journey has the tau protein already progressed so that in effect through these types of scans some people speculate that you can talk about staging of Alzheimer's disease in the same way that you talk about staging of cancer how far along uh, has this this tau protein spread what about uh, nerve cell uh, nerve cell loss neurodegeneration the way we currently do it is by doing head scans where we look at uh, slices slices of the brain and we look at how much tissue there is and for example in an Alzheimer's disease we would look at how much tissue loss there is 
in the medial temporal lobe. So this is uh, this is the the bit here on 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 the sides on the left and on the right um, that you start to uh, you start to lose tissue specifically in Alzheimer's disease. Another way to to look at nerve cell loss is to um, is to do another type of PET scan. This time, what we label is the glucose. Okay, we label it with tiny bits of radioactivity and we inject we inject it into the patient, and then when you push people uh, this person through the scanner, you see which bits of the brain are use are, are, are eating up less glucose than then they should be. The brain is a very glucose heavy organ, so if everything is working well, then basically all, all parts of the brain will be eating up glucose quite hungrily. But if you have a, a, a bit of the brain which is losing nerve cells, it will, on this scan, it will appear as blue. It's, it's simply, it's lost its tissue and therefore it's not able to eat up the glucose. Now, the next frontier is uh, our, our blood biomarkers because all of these investigations, as you can guess, they involve radioactivity, they're invasive, they are very dependent on, on having very expensive facilities which are not everywhere in the country. And one of the big steps forward has been the development of, of these same biomarkers for amyloid, for tau, and for nerve cell loss simply through a blood test. Um, and, and these are perhaps the two ones which are the best well validated. One is called phosphorylated tau. Um, and what it's looking at is the level of, of, of these, of these ch changed tau protein in the blood. Uh, and what it shows on the left is that this type of protein, you, you see elevations in this type of protein, but really only in Alzheimer's disease. You do not get the same type of elevations in other types of, 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 of dementia, like, uh, um, like PSP or, uh, or frontotemporal dementia or, uh, or, or, progressive, or progressive aphasia. So this seems to be a very specific biomarker, a very specific test for Alzheimer's disease. And it shows you that there is a combination of amyloid and tau happening in the brain, which really only happens in Alzheimer's. And on the right, is another blood test uh, which is called neurofilament light. Neurofilament is a protein that builds, that if you like, uh, supports the structures of the of the axons of the neurons. So these are the long protrusions that uh, that nerve cells have. And basically, any condition where you have nerve cell loss, this type of proteins get released gets released in the bloodstream. Um, and this uh, neurofilament light has been shown to be increased in Alzheimer's disease, indicating nerve cell loss, as well as in a lot of other forms of dementia. So between these two proteins, you have one which shows you that you can detect nerve cell loss in the blood as well as Alzheimer's disease. What's that left us is that uh, on the basis of the Great Minds cohort uh, and, and the, and the uh, associated FAST study, that we're leading in, in which we are testing the we're, we're offering people the opportunity to give blood. We have been successful in um, attracting a very large uh, a very large program uh, funding from the Alzheimer's Society and Alzheimer's Research UK, um, the National Institute of, of Health Research, and the People's Lottery, uh, where we will conduct a, a study where we'll collect uh, blood from over three thousand people. And we'll try and work out which one or which combination of biomarkers is most useful in real world, uh, in real world memory clinic. Okay, so these are three thousand people uh, coming for, for a memory clinic diagnosis, and we'll work out which blood biomarker is most useful. Um, we will also enrich for people that we typically find difficult to to get involved in research. Uh, people from ethnic minorities, people from uh, who are who are quite old, people who have a particular medical conditions that we think will will, will impact the, uh, the the blood biomarkers, and then we'll we'll check for very practical things as well, like can we use a blood spot uh, card instead of that you can do at home rather than uh, rather than one that you have to come into the clinic for, and then this is the first three years of the program, and then in the in the second two years we'll run a randomized control trial where we'll ask the the question right. So we've identified which blood biomarker is most useful in a clinical setting, but then what happens if we feed that information back to a clinician and to, uh, and to patients? 
um, and we'll have 440 people in each group. One group will get uh, their results uh, after two weeks and one will just carry on as normal. And then we'll look at uh, what the impact on the quality of life of the patients are, um, on, the, on the experience of their carers as well, what is, their, what is, what is the impact on their healthcare, uh, on their healthcare journey. And finally, I said I'll, I'll touch on on on, uh, on on the on the very recent developments around treatments and and what does that mean for the field? Um, as you as you would have probably picked up, there are now these uh, therapies uh, based on antibodies, uh, which are currently being looked at uh, in in this country. So uh, I sit on the committee uh, at the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which decides on which therapies to, uh, to, uh, to allow in the NHS, and we had the meeting earlier this month, um, to, uh, to look at these types of therapies. What they do is they are uh, essentially antibodies, uh, so, um, so particles which uh, are tar highly targeted to a particular protein, and they either uh, break down these amyloid plaques that I showed you, or they prevent the plaques from, from, uh, from forming in the first place. Um, and the data that's coming out in the studies that were submitted show that the people who, who have these uh, anti-amyloid therapies, uh, these are uh, infusions every two weeks, have a, a, an almost complete uh, removal of the amyloid protein, uh, which is sort of very striking. And also they've been able to show that there is some, and this is hotly debated in the moment of how significant that is, but there is some improvement in terms of people's um, in people's memory, at, at, the, at the rate at which people lose their memory and thinking skills, at the way that, at the way in which they lose their, if you like, everyday uh, function, so that in effect they delay the, the, the disease progression by about six to nine months. So it's nothing, uh, if you like, um, revolutionary in terms of the magnitude of the disease, but it's the first therapy that shows that by removing the Alzheimer's protein, or at least what we think of an Alzheimer's protein, you actually affect some, some downstream effects. You actually have some effects on, on everyday function and cognition. So it's a big change for, uh, for our field, and we'll see exactly if and when this gets rolled out in the, in the NHS. But if it does get, get rolled out in the NHS, we'll have to go back to these tests that I showed you because we'll have to completely change the way in which we, we diagnose dementia. We'll no longer be able to refer patients to one of these therapies on the basis of just a paper test and an interview. We have to have been able to show they actually have the underlying protein for them to qualify for one of these therapies. And so we'll be talking about PET amyloid therapies and, and lumbar punctures and, and, and blood tests. So in a way, having a much more biological form of, uh, of di uh, diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. Having said that, all of that is contingent on the regulators in this country uh, deciding that this is a therapy that brings in us enough, enough benefit to, uh, to the patient and the society at large. So finally, um, uh, if you want to help with, with all of this research that we're doing, uh, you can always uh, get in touch with us. We're, we're interested in, in both people who have cognitive disorders, but also people who are aging adults. Uh, and you can come to, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, website where uh, we, can, we can take your details and we can be in touch with studies that match you. Um, and that's uh, all I had to say. Thank you very much. There's been a lot of questions online. Um, I'd like to have some from the floor if, if anybody, from in the room, if anybody has them. But let's kick off with one, uh, one general area uh, that, that has been asked about um, in terms of the reduced access to education um, and the, the worrying, perceived worrying lack of, of, of education classes for, for older people and whether that should, whether it should move into GP prescription, so GP should pres prescribe longer uh, further education for, for, for people, uh, uh, older age people, uh, and whether there should be a campaign to government uh, to, to, to encourage uh, easier access and, and cheaper access to, to, to education activities. So I think, I think um, quite a lot of uh, GPs will use social prescribing these days, and social prescribing people kind of think about it in terms of, you know, people get sent to a gym to do some exercise because they're overweight or something like that. Um, but I think um, certainly in, in the Lancaster area that the, the, the GPs have a long list of 
social prescribing activities that they can they can send people to and a lot of them are sort of social and intellectual engagement so they are things like university of the third age um or um you know there's sort of intervention music intervention for people living with dementia and things like that so i think social prescribing is one way of doing it but i also think I, I, whoever you know sent that um email i think the um you know the, the sort of campaigns for for lifelong learning um there is supposed to be funding for lifelong learning but i'm not really seeing it how how it's having any impact yet um but i think yes cert certainly on a sort of policy and political level um the, the it's you know we've got evidence so in the same way as we have evidence for you know getting rid of uh, a, an age at which people should retire which we've now got rid of uh, in terms of people can work for as long as they they want to or need to um which we know you know in in on the one hand is actually quite good for us intellectually and, and cognitively as we get older to carry on being engaged in the workplace and that kind of thing. So in the same way, uh, being able to carry on with intellectual engagement, whether or not your job um, has finished or whether or not your job is intellectually demanding or, or engaging, um, being, being able to find intellectual um, stimulus outside of work, um, you know, education would be a very good, uh, very good way to go. Yeah, I just wanted to add that I work as a social worker and part of our uh, Care Act assessment is to is a tick box for if somebody is involved in any learning, education, but often than that, often than not, it's left blank. So I just wanted to know what if you've made any links with any local authorities or um, adult, care, um, adult care services or care homes, because when I go into care homes, often they're not people with dementia are sat and they're not really um, involved in any activities or not being stimulated. So I don't know what, what work is being done to pass this knowledge, this fantastic studies that you're doing to, to appropriate services or to like, you know, push the government or uh, local authorities to improve, um, you know, to, to, um, use this knowledge that you've gained to uh, provide services for people. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose my role as a, I mean, I'm a, I'm a researcher, I'm not a, a you know, a politician, um, but, you know, I, you know, I'm always very happy to go out to, to groups like this or other groups to, to, to talk. What we do in Lancaster, we have what's called a research showcase where we invite local politicians and we invite local um, decision makers, if you like, um, to come in and listen to the kind of research that we're doing in ageing. Um, and they're very popular, you know, it's similar to, to the kind of thing we've got today. We have an online and people in, in person. Um, they've, they've become quite big um, and we pick a different topic each year. So so some years it could be dementia, another year it could be communication, another year it could be loneliness, you know, it, it, different different kinds of topics. Um, we try and make them a little bit general. Uh, so, so I suppose my, my job is to get that knowledge out there not just in scientific papers that um, um, only other researchers read, but to talk to people. So we do work with the local council. We're not working on education at the moment with the local council. Um, I have worked with retirement villages, not so much care homes, but more retirement villages where people are uh, the sort of bigger range of um, cognitive function, as in most care homes, I would say probably the majority of people have some kind of dementia or serious cognitive decline, whereas in the retirement villages it's a bigger a bigger range. Um, so we have worked with uh, one particular organisation um, that has a lot of retirement villages on their wellbeing program, um, and they they seem very aware of the you know the benefits of intellectual and social engagement. Um, but I think maybe care homes less so. Um, I teach. Um, I teach a course on dementia, which is largely aimed at uh, sort of managers of care homes and uh, or, or different kind of interventions for, for people living with dementia. Uh, so hopefully we're getting we're getting out in the teaching, but people have to come along for the training. Um, they don't necessarily um, we don't necessarily go out to care homes apart from unless we're doing a study with them. Thank you. A um, couple of related questions. Firstly, somebody has been told that once you've been diagnosed with dementia, you'll never learn anything new. And secondly, and related to that, is there anything we can do that people have been diagnosed with dementia other than advise particular lifestyle changes? Do you want to go? I would like to answer this one because I work with a lot of people living with dementia out in the community and in residential care. And um, I'd like to challenge that statement that there's nothing more that, that they can do, particularly with um, music. There's actually been quite a lot of studies on people, even in very severe stages of dementia being able to learn new songs that they've never heard before 
learning is possible, it just may not be possible in that explicit manner that we're used to before dementia diagnosis, so it might be more implicit, there might not be a memory specifically of that learning taking place, but some learning can happen. Um, I think that needs to be more explored. Certainly we try and do a lot more musical activities with people living with dementia and you can see that there is progression. So I definitely think there is things that can be done. Um, so yes, that's my challenge. <laughs> I, I absolutely agree. I think you know the, the, the days of getting a diagnosis of, of dementia and then going home and sitting in a corner and never doing anything else again, uh, hopefully have long gone. You know, I, I think you know everywhere you go there, there are active interventions for people living with dementia. Um, not just about learning new stuff, but basically having fun um, and having, having you know, sort of good well-being and, and good social interaction and, and not kind of being stuck in a corner. I'd, I'd like to also add as well, there's some very engaged individuals living with dementia who are activists, who are part of research advisory groups. There's a, a lot of, a lot more still to give during dementia and a lot of life left to live as well. Yeah. Thank you. Changing tack quite a lot. Um, can can the, somebody tell us uh, if there's any uh, if if studies are taking into account the effect of drugs and medication on bringing on dementia, such as uh, drugs taken for overactive bladder, um, which is apparently known to bring on dementia. So are these are, are is the impact of other medications being uh, considered during studies? <laughs> um, so, so the, uh, I guess there is an established link between uh, certain certain drugs and, and the ones that you mentioned around the overactive uh, bladder, but also other ones like antidepressants. They're known to as sort of having a cholinergic burden. Okay, so um, now the caveat here is that these are essentially drugs that, while you're taking them, they will impact your cognitive function. Okay. And so um, they're particularly bad for people who have who have dementia because they make life very difficult. Um, I think it's it's debatable whether these drugs themselves bring on dementia, but certainly if you have the underpinnings of dementia, and as I described, this is a process that takes a long time that essentially erodes the the ability of the brain to to withstand sort of additional uh, additional problems. Um, when you add a medication like this, which is uh, which which impairs cognition, it, it, it invariably is uh, is sort of brings on difficulties. So, uh, you know, I I wouldn't go as far as saying that they cause dementia, but they certainly cause cognitive impairment. Okay, um, now move to a recent report that's come out about APOE. Mm. Um, it, does the panel have any view on uh, the, the, the recently publicised paper that having APOE4 uh, may be seen as a causative factor for Alzheimer's disease rather than a risk factor? Um, and the person asking, how is APOE4 homozygous? Mm. Okay, so, so this refers to the recent paper which shows that having two copies of the APOE4 allele, uh, so just so that everyone's on board, essentially there is a, a gene uh, called APOE. It comes in three main forms, two, three, and four. Um, and the, f the, the four, which is relatively rare, about 10% of people have a form of, of APOE num number four, um, essentially increases your risk of dementia. We know this. There's about 10 to 15 fold increase. And like with any gene, uh, you get one copy from your mum, one copy from your dad. And if you have, if both, of, if both your mum sent you a a number four copy, as well as your your and as well as your 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 other pa parents send you number four. You have two versions of of the high risk gene. So what this paper showed that if you're one of these people, they're extremely rare that have four and four. Um, that the the paper contended that they that it's essentially a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease. Um, the criticisms of that paper have been that even even within the sample that they reported. Quite a few people who were four and four didn't develop didn't develop dementia uh, by the age of eighty five. So there's a bit of inconsistency there, but I think it's very difficult to argue that having two versions of the the, the four and four gene um, expose you to a high risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. But I wouldn't say that it's 
it's it's been established that is it is a given. Let's put it that way. Uh, I think we're still thinking of Apple E4 gene as a, as a risk factor, but the data the data is accumulating. Okay, thank you. Um, then thinking about education um, and how does that compare with emotional entangle? In, sorry, emotional engagement, mindfulness, and intelligence. Ooh. <laughs> in what way? Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think. So um, I think the, the, there, is, uh, the, there is a sort of a very good uh, set of studies done on um, the Lothian cohort. I don't know if people are aware of that, uh, which was um, in Scotland. They found in, in a cupboard somewhere um, a load of intelligence tests on children um, aged 11 from a long time ago, uh, 1930s, I think it was, and uh, they managed because it was an area where people didn't really move move around. They managed to find most of these people who were still around in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and they were, they were, I think, they were in their 70s when they first found them because they were all from one school year. And they managed to f to, to follow them to, to look at whether the impact of this intelligence test when they were 11 um, had an impact on their later life cognition and their later life intellectual engagement. And of course, it did. You know, if people who are um, you know, have more um, sort of intelligence at, at age 11 are, are more likely to engage more with education and so on. So, so there were long-term effects, but it wasn't the only thing that, that mattered. There were other, other, you know, opportunities that people were able to make, make the most of throughout life. Mindfulness was the other one? Yeah. Well, I think yeah. emotional intelligence was, was the core of the question. Was it? Okay. Right. So if you like, whether whether, if you like, what we what we would see as academic intelligence, whether there's any meaningful difference in terms of dementia risk when you compare it to emotional intelligence. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I, I don't know any studies on emotional intelligence, do you? Not particularly, but, yeah. I, you know, when I heard the question, I was sort of, I, I thought I should look it up. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the same, I mean, you know, mindfulness is, is a useful um, intervention, but we, we don't really know much about the in, interaction with mindfulness practice and, and dementia or, or cognition. Uh, there may be studies out there, but I don't know them. Okay. Um, we, we, there's been, obviously been reference to the pandemic and uh, the impacts of the pandemic, but are there any indicators to link COVID and long COVID with cognitive decline? I think there was certainly in terms of the social isolation part yeah. and I'm sure that that seemed to have more of an effect on cognitive decline. So the less socially engaged people were during that time, obviously that had an effect. Um, I, I don't know, like past yeah. that what? Yeah, there, there's, um, so I have, I've got a PhD student actually who's looking at the effect of long COVID on cognition because people with long COVID would report, you know, what they describe as brain fog. Um, and so there are quite a few studies coming out now showing the the impact um, on increased risk, not just not, not to say everybody with long COVID is going to get dementia, but increased risk of new um, newly diagnosed uh, dementia in older people with long COVID. So he's not look, he's not been looking at across the range. He's, he's only been looking at sort of over 65s with long COVID. But saying that, the when he actually did the, the meta-analysis, it wasn't hugely different from other respiratory diseases. If somebody else, somebody had had a, another kind of respiratory disease, it also had an impact on cognition. We've certainly looked at a large uh, American cohort uh, and uh, sort of compared it against, say, for example, having had the flu. And in the immediate period after people had severe COVID, which I, I you know, with the caveat that that's different from long COVID, there was a, an, a substantial increase in new diagnosis afterwards, but that probably reflects more the severity of the disease yeah, yeah. Um, rather than, rather than yeah, long COVID per se. Okay, an act, area of active research, I'm sure, but um, different area. Um, has there been any study on the effect of comedy in dementia? My husband would laugh at jokes or witty comments on television, even though his language skills had diminished. I know there's a lot of interventions and programmes that look at different ways of engaging people and allowing people to be playful. I think that's something that can be quite undervalued at times. Um, there's great work um, by uh, many academics. One that I, I can think of off the top of my head is Pia Contos, who talks about, um, I think it was kind of drama. These people would, would go and, and almost do I think it was clowning she was talking about and they were going into a care home and it was just the relationality between people and the kind of different playfulness that that would evoke and how that changed 
how that changed the caring relationship and how that kind of changed the person living with dementia, their their kind of moment in time. So I'm not sure that it's it's been examined in terms of cognition, but the value of playfulness and humour um, has been looked at in terms of quality of life perspectives, for sure. OK. Um, then... Uh... How much do the effects of depression and anxiety detract from the beneficial effects that music training and long life education uh, and learning uh, have on later life cognition? That's a great question. In terms of music, I think there those effects are examined separately. So there'll be music interventions that are, are looked at in terms of how, how much does that change somebody's depression or anxiety scale and how much does it have an effect on their cognition. I'm not sure if the relationship between the two is really... I can't yeah, think but, of anything. I mean, as a clinician, um, do you know about sort of long, you know, long term impacts of clinical depression? Um, well, certainly clinical depression um, will affect your cognition uh, in while you're having the, 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 the cognition so much so that people talk about pseudo dementia when people are very cognitively impaired. Um, but as, as, the, as the depression recedes, um, the cognition picks up. Now, there is an interesting link between having depression and dementia risk. Uh, that there's, a, there's, been, there's been talk of whether, you know, there's certainly a relationship where in the years before people de develop dementia, there is a, there, there's typically mood symptoms and you get the typical conversations in these cases which is does the depression if you like cause the dementia or increase the dementia or is it that you know depression is part of the the prodrome of of dementia so the the first early signs that the person has dementia so it's a typically complex relationship but i think on a, on a practical level i think having a significant depression will affect one's motivation to engage with the sort of things that you have you have always spoken about that we know are helpful any form of activity be it social uh, be it uh, physical be it intellectual all of these things are affected as core symptoms of depression so i think even if it's not a direct relationship i think indirectly i imagine that it has a has an effect yeah in the um the cognitive frailty work that we're doing so so we've got the pe people with physical frailty who then develop cognitive impairment as well, and, and they've got the two together. De de depression seems to be one of those intermediaries that have an effect on whether people go from one to having both. Um, so, you know, again, probably for the, for the reasons outlined just outlined now, uh, in terms of you know lack of motivation, um, apathy is often associated with depression, um, withdrawal. Um, and, and if, you, if you're not going out and about, you're also not being physically active, and physically active is, it has a big impact on frailty. But it also has a big impact on cognition as well. It is actually something that we do have to screen for whenever we're looking at the results of um, Cognospeak, in as much as that we know that depression and anxiety can have a big impact both on people's kind of cognitive ability, but also just the way that they talk. Uh, so it is something that is quite difficult to disentangle, especially when it comes to like actual cognitive performance. But we are actually seeing that we can almost predict the individuals who are at a high risk of having high levels of depression and anxiety from their speech also. So it is something that, um, although it makes it a little bit difficult in terms of seeing the, the memory abilities, it is actually also a, a tool that we could be using uh, to look at that also, just in terms of language. If I can sneak a question question to you about richness of richness of, of speech. Uh, I'm always reminded of this study where they picked up uh, the, the writings of, 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 of women who were going into, into the, uh, to become nuns, right? They have to write an essay, so they would have been in their sort of late teens, early 20s, and they looked at just the, the richness of the language uh, 40, 50, 60 years onwards, uh, and whether that mediated their dementia risk. And <laughs> surprise, surprise, it did. So there's something about richness of language from a, from a relatively early age is that how are you looking at that in in, in Cognospeak and, and sort of analyzing speech data about the if you like the the range of vocabulary? Um, how is that looked at? So that's a really good question. Unfortunately, I'm not involved very much in the actual data analysis. But in terms of the verbal fluency tasks that we use, so 
how many words can you produce with the letter P, how many animals can you produce, there is something that we look at in terms of age of acquisition, so the age at which we expect someone would first come across this word or first learn this word. Uh, and there's kind of this idea that individuals who have cognitive impairment start to rely on words that are much simpler, that you may have learned much, much earlier uh, in terms of uh, the progression of your life. So people with dementia may still be able to come up with cat, dog in terms of uh, the animals that they produce, but it's, it's unlikely that they'd be producing aardvark or ocelot. Um, it's also, in terms of the semantic richness of what someone's saying, uh, if someone starts, I talk a lot about the verbal fluency task, that's what I'm more familiar with, but if someone starts talking about a, a farmyard animal, they may then say cow and then pig and then sheep and then horse, you can see that they are building a, 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 across this kind of semantic richness of these related items. Whereas an individual with cognitive impairment, we've seen can struggle to develop uh, what is within this category associated. So it has to kind of hop from, from dolphin all the way across to worm, all the way across to elephant, because it, there is that difficulty in expanding upon the richness um, there was a couple of studies that were looking at kind of Iris Murdoch is a author who went on to develop dementia and in her writing they actually looked back and you could see the, the deterioration of the, the syntax, the grammar, the words themselves being used uh, and despite the fact that she is like incredibly rich in her language there was this deterioration from 10 years prior to her actually getting the, the diagnosis so it is definitely something that we do have to look at we can't unfortunately see how much someone previously knew, but we can now see what they can still produce. And doing that longitudinal tracking over time will allow us to kind of see is someone's ability to have this semantic richness deteriorating uh, as possibly a marker of them having cognitive impairment. Thank you. Probably just a couple of quick questions uh, to finish off on. Uh, and relating to what we we're just talking about, how badly can nerves affect the score of such as naming animals? It's definitely something that uh, we do see. A lot of people in the recordings will say, I, I can't think of anything else, but it's a minute that you have. And a minute, when you first hear about it, doesn't feel like a lot. But sitting there, you start to realise, oh, actually, no, this is quite long. and I have to keep talking. So uh, eventually people tend to settle in, tend to find their groove. But that is also just something that we are aware of and we have people take this assessment at home. They can take it at whatever time works for them. Um, we try to make the avatar as, as inviting as possible. They nod along and they smile. Um, so it's a test that is going to be difficult and that's kind of what actually allows us to tell if there is an impairment or not. But uh, the effect of nerves hopefully shouldn't be so great that they're unable to produce any words whatsoever if they don't have... Uh, a form of cognitive impairment. I have had people come back and say, I've been practicing this when we play it as a game in the car, you know, okay. <laughs> yeah. We had that during the pandemic. Um, we did a lot of our cognitive tests online, but we also had an iPad app that we gave them to do the trail making test and we'd found out through the logs that someone had been practicing. So we had to throw them out, unfortunately. Just out of the, the analysis, not out of the program, of course. OK, we probably ought to wrap up soon. So, I mean, just one very straightforward question. Um, if one is assessed with early onset dementia, is it mandatory that they stop driving? Ooh. It's, it's, it's a torn issue, driving and, and dementia, uh, regardless of whether it's early onset or not. Uh, early onset refers to, do they have, did, is it diagnosed before the age of 65 or not? So in a way, that's, that's not the issue here. The issue is, when you when you are, when you get diagnosed with dementia, you have to inform the DVLA. Okay, now that doesn't mean that he shouldn't drive. That he shouldn't drive, but it means that the DVLA may choose to, uh, you know, that they'll they'll look into your case. Certainly, the way that we manage this in in our clinic is to give the option of people to uh, to go to a to a form of a driving test that is available in most in most places where somebody that's independent can look at the quality of their driving. Usually it, it will mean, I mean, unfortunately, dementia is a, is a progressive condition. So they'll have, even if you've found that you're safe to drive, probably it will be uh, for a certain period before you get assessed again. 
and so on. So it's it's not an automatic thing, but you know you do have to inform the DVLA, and in many cases you have to go through a formal testing. Um, going to say we actually do have a, a separate study looking at um, the use of you know the black box which often young drivers get given to kind of track their driving the speeds that they're doing this that and the other looking at using a form of this black box a telematic device to try and help identify when people should start considering whether their driving behavior is still safe once they have possibly a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment or uh, the early stages of dementia um, it's still very much in its development stage, unfortunately, but we would be looking at seeing whether this could be useful, not in necessarily determining exactly you have to give up now, but helping people to decide for themselves and have those conversations with family members as to whether or not giving up driving is something that would make them safer. Good. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you. We're very grateful that you, you took the time to, to speak to us. We're very grateful to everyone who came in and to everybody who joined online. Um, yeah, and, and we're thankful to, to our colleagues at Sheffield for hosting us. Uh, it's been great. And uh, we hope to see you all again. We'll have another one of these in six months and we're open for suggestion. Everybody will receive a feedback form. So if there's a particular topic that you want us to cover, uh, we are collecting these and we're, we're getting to them one at a time. Good, with that, we thank you.